Welcome all. Uh, this is the fourth course of the uh, Center for Quantum Networks uh, Winter School. And uh, I'll, I'm Don Towsley. I'm a professor at the University of Massachusetts. And along with uh, Mateo Sandrade, who's a, a PhD student at the University of Massachusetts, uh, what we would like to do in this uh, three, three and a half hour uh, period is to sort of cover some of the principles of quantum networks, sort of relate them to classical networks. Uh, and hopefully at the end, you'll have sort of appreciation of sort of tools that are used for looking at the higher layers of quantum network. Before we get started, however, uh, we have a couple of poll questions. I'm curious uh, what uh, your knowledge of quantum information systems is. And because we're going to be talking very much about networking, uh, very analogous to classical networks, what your background is in classical networks as well. So yeah, Mateo says, just put the first poll question. And after uh, you answer, then we'll put up the second one. And then I'll introduce uh, the course and what we're going to talk about. <clears throat> okay. So uh, I'm curious. Okay, so uh, it's going to be a mix. Um, I will be talking a little bit about quantum. And if you've uh, sort of sat in on the uh, previous courses, I think it, nothing will be new to you. But when it is, it should still be sort of easy to understand. Go ahead with the uh, uh, question about classical networks. Uh, that's what I'm uh, especially intrigued about. Uh, I'm curious whether some of you or many of you are coming to this course having a background in classical networks and are really interested in sort of understanding what quantum networks are and, and what kinds of opportunities they may uh, provide uh, either in terms of engineering or research. Okay, so it sounds like uh, uh, the majority of you have some exposure and, and almost uh, half of you have had a course. And so uh, you certainly won't find my coverage of classical networks sort of new, but I think you'll find it interesting in contrast with uh, what quantum network seems to be coming along as. Okay, so let, let's get started. Um, the outline of the course is I'm, I'm going to spend maybe 20 minutes or so sort of uh, with a, an introduction to quantum networks. Uh, then I'm going to spend a period of time talking about classical and quantum networks and comparing and contrasting them. The, the rest of the course will look at sort of more technical topics. Um, I will spend some time talking about, if you want, you can think of performance modeling and resource allocation uh, for quantum networks. And then Mateos is going to talk about network management and some of the interesting challenges that uh, quantum network tomography bring to bear. Um, and then we'll end with a summary and, and let's say some uh, challenges that might be of interest. So what we're really focused on is the sort of future vision of a quantum internet, uh, where we'll have a quantum network that will enable full connectivity between multiple user groups. Uh, and user groups, uh, we're talking about users that uh, um, all over the world being able to connect to quantum computers. This network is going to have some similarities to a in the internet it'll have quantum switches 
and quantum routers and, and so on and so forth. And the, the enabling idea here is the use of quantum entanglement, uh, also known as bell states. Uh, I'll probably use the term bell pair, EPR pair sort of interchangeably between two remote quantum processors. And just to remind you in the bracket notation, a bell state uh, looks like the following here. Uh, you have two qubits, one belonging to Alice, the other belonging to Bob that are in this superposition state. And you can think of it that, uh, let's say Alice and Bob share, they have two coins. Uh, the coin can either be heads or tail. And uh, their being entangled means that if Alice goes to flip the coin and she, uh, let's say, results in a head, uh, that will result in that when Bob decides to flip his coin, he will get the same result. And uh, Einstein referred to this as spooky action at a distance. And I think this came up in other courses, but I'll remind you that this was really the gist of Nobel Prize in physics this year. Uh, and what I find really interesting is the first two researchers were skeptics. They didn't believe in this, uh, but they developed uh, experiments uh, so that showed that in fact, entanglement could not be explained by classical ideas. Okay, so why the quantum internet? You've probably seen some of this before. There is a, a strong interest in uh, quantum security, in particular quantum key distribution. And that's going to require that the users be connected by a quantum network. Uh, there's the idea that we're not going to be building any large monolithic quantum computers anytime soon, but that we'll build lots of small ones. And so if we have a quantum network to connect them um, and to be able to allow distributed quantum computing, uh, we may be able to solve very uh, important and interesting problems. And it turns out that it, it, entanglement is very useful uh, for distributed uh, sensing, uh, as you might have using multiple telescopes at, uh, let's say, different parts of the country or the earth. And by entangling them, you can get much greater quality uh, resolution than otherwise. So just to remind you with a bell state, uh, I wrote it down before, superposition of two qubits, uh, either uh, superposition of zeros and ones, uh, with essentially equal amplitudes. And what uh, we know is that if uh, you measure, if Alice measures her qubit, and she's going to get a zero or a one. And if she gets a zero, then Bob will always measure a zero. If she gets a one, she'll, he'll always measure a one. Okay, and this can generate shared randomness across distances. And you can sort of see how this could be very useful for, uh, uh, let's say, security. Um, and it's the key ingredient for quantum teleportation, uh, for quantum key distribution, and just many, many other applications. And what I'd like to do is quickly uh, remind you about quantum teleportation. Uh, we have Alice. Uh, and Bob. Alice and Bob share uh, one of these bell states. And Alice has a qubit uh, represented by this red star that she would like to transfer to Bob. You know, maybe Alice is an experimentalist and she d was able to generate this really exciting qubit and she wants to give it to Bob uh, so that Bob can play around with it. Okay, and teleportation allows you to do that. It uh, corresponds to doing a, a measurement on Alice's part of both of her qubits. 
Uh, that will generate zeros and ones. Maybe it's one zero. Bob uh, doesn't really know what's going on. And so Alice then transmits the uh, two classical bits to Bob. And Bob can use those to essentially perform a correction on his qubit, which will produce uh, the qubit that uh, the quantum state that Alice wanted to transfer. And just uh, so that you can see the, if the teleportation circuit is really, really very simple. Uh, Alice and Bob shared this uh, bell pair. Alice has this uh, qubit that she wants to transfer the quantum state. And it just corresponds to a simple C naught and then measurements. Uh, this measurement is in the sine basis for those of you who know that what that is. Uh, this qubit is measured in the computational basis. They generate these bits, uh, get sent to Bob, and then Bob can just use those to decide how to correct. Um, I'll mention one extension. Uh, I'm not sure. I think that uh, Mateus will talk about this in some of the uh, uh, his uh, lecture. Um, but uh, needless to say, you could have a similar kind of uh, of state, but involving three or more qubits. Uh, and so there's what is known as a Greenberger Horn Zellinger or GHZ state. And it's just uh, the obvious extension uh, that you see here. Uh, and this is used in multi-party quantum key distribution, secret sharing, quantum uh, sensing. Um, and so on. So now let's get back to networking. And let's start off with, we have Alice and Bob, and they want to, let's say, share this bell pair. And, and maybe Alice prepares it and sends the, uh, the second qubit to Bob. And the question is, why is it so hard to do this? And the reason uh, is that the rate decays exponentially with distance. And what it is, is that the probability that, let's say this qubit is successfully transmitted to Bob, essentially decays exponentially. And so you get a, a rate that it goes as E to the minus alpha L over two, where L is the distance and alpha is some coefficient related to the let's say the transmission medium. Uh, in the, uh, this case, typically it would be an optical fiber. Okay, so that brings up a question. If, if we were working in sort of like classical terms, uh, what we would do is we would just uh, put a repeater in the middle and we would amplify the signal. Okay, we might even decode it and then just re-encode it. And the question is, can we do that here and the answer, unfortunately, is that there, the no cloning theorem uh, or says that you cannot copy quantum signals. And so that brings up a, a challenge of how we're going to be able to transmit uh, quantum information over distances. So before we go on, uh, just a... A, a poll question. I, I just want uh, to see uh, whether you've been sort of uh, uh, listening uh, through this. And and the poll question is really, you know, what's the generation rate of EPR pairs? I mean, how does it change over distance when you do direct transmission, let's say through an optical fiber? Uh, do you get a polynomial decrease? Uh, does it stay constant? Uh, does it depend on the fiber technology? Uh, um, do you get an exponential decrease? Uh, so go ahead. Uh, we'll give you a, a few seconds to, to look at that. Uh, well, you, 
uh, looking at the poll question, there's a question by Edward Beadle. And uh, the question is, uh, is the measurement only probabilistic? And the answer is yes, it is probabilistic. Uh, in the case of a bell pair, uh, the qubits have been prepared so that the two states, 0, 0, and 1, 1, have the same amplitude. Uh, uh, and so therefore, when you go to do a measurement, Alice will always measure zero with probability one half and measure one with probability one half. Okay, good. I'm good, glad to see this, uh, right? Uh, uh, what, as I said in the previous slide, is that you have an exponential decrease in rate. And that really poses a, a challenge to building a quantum network. Okay. So what has been proposed as a way to deal with this? Uh, the idea is to, uh, let's say, uh, introduce what's called a quantum repeater. And you can think of it as a quantum repeater as having lots of quantum memories that can be used to store entanglement. Okay, and so here I show Alice and Bob, and we have a repeater in the middle with a lot of quantum memory. And so what uh, Alice does is generate a bell state with the repeater, uh, Bob does the same thing. And when those bell states are created, then the repeater just stores uh, its qubits in quantum memory, okay? And once, let's say, bell states have been uh, generated between Alice and the repeater and between Bob and the repeater, the repeater then performs a measurement on the two qubits, and that has the effect of propagating the, the bell pair to the endpoints. And if you think about it, this measurement is really just a teleportation. Uh, what the repeater can do is just say, okay, I've got this bell pair with Bob. I've got this qubit here that I need to transfer uh, the state to Bob. And so I teleport it uh, to Bob. And what that, of course, will also mean is that the repeater will generate two classical bits, and those two classical bits will have to be transmitted to Bob so that Bob can make the proper correction. Okay, um, and the effect of that is that now the rate only depends on the distances between Alice and the repeater and Bob and the repeater. And so you get a sort of a lower, a slower decay on the rate. It's now uh, exponent is L over two rather than L. And so you can take that to sort of like a, a uh, extend it uh, and add more and more repeaters. And in principle, then you can make the rate essentially constant. Uh, if you have a distance, let's say L, then what you do is you just add repeaters so that the distance between repeaters uh, remains constant. And so that's a way that has been proposed to combat this exponential decay. So this brings us to what a quantum uh, entanglement network might look like. Uh, we're gonna have a bunch of quantum switches. Uh, they're gonna be connected with lossy links. Uh, they're gonna have memories uh, both at the switches and uh, let's say at the end nodes. And then the links are gonna generate these bell states between among themselves. And then the switches, uh, their responsibility will then be to essentially pair up link states and essentially measure them 
so as to realize end-to-end uh, -end entanglement, let's say, between these two end nodes here. Okay, and so that brings up the, the, the question of this, what challenges does this, let's say, quantum network uh, uh, sort of pose for us? And the first one is what service should it provide? Um, the way I've been describing it, it's as if what it's doing is generating bell pairs and propagating bell pairs to end users. Uh, and, and that works great. If uh, and two end users want to transfer quantum information between each other, they can use teleportation along with these uh, bell states uh, to do that, okay? But you could have decide to build a quantum network that rather than generate bell pairs and distribute them, would just do direct transfer of quantum information from one end node to another, okay? And, uh, the second challenge is that uh, if you've been in some of these uh, classes already, you know that quantum state, quantum information is very, very vulnerable to noise in the environment. And so a big challenge is how to deal with that noise. And we'll talk about that a little bit. Uh, question. Another challenge is you uh, expect that this network is going to be shared by many, let's say, pairs of users, many applications. And so then the question comes up as to who do you serve? Uh, how do you allocate resources among the different users and different applications? What kind of performance can you expect to get from a network like this? Another challenge, you've built this. Uh, the uh, nodes and the links uh, may be faulty, and uh, you uh, need to be able to manage this network and keep track of what's going on. And so that brings up questions of like, how should you do measurement and how might you do tomography? Another challenge is, has to do with how you're going to control this. Uh, and in particular, we're going to have this quantum data plane, but we're going to need a control plane as well. And if you uh, listen to uh, Professor Kilper when he talked about optical network, uh, the thought is that uh, uh, we in the quantum world will borrow ideas from software defined networking, let's say, to, to do this. But there's also a very interesting question is, could everything be done, let's say, using just quantum information? Okay, um, so that's the introduction. And let me stop uh, for a couple of minutes and uh, let's see, uh, try to answer some of the questions that have come up. Uh, uh, one second. So there's a question about what does generation rate mean? And when I introduced it here, what I meant is that it's the rate at which, let's say, Alice and Bob, let's say, are able to generate bell pairs between themselves. Okay. And I guess there was a question about teleportation and without going into uh, terrible detail, uh, 
again, the, the important idea behind it is that Alice and Bob have to share a bell pair. Okay, so uh, the first qubit of this bell pair then belongs to Alice, and the second one belongs to Bob. And then Alice has, let's say, a qubit that uh, she wants to transfer the quantum state uh, to Bob. And it turns out that there are some very simple operations uh, that were in the circuit that I showed that can be performed between, uh, let's say, this qubit here and uh, the qubit belonging to the bell pair that Alice owns, after which there's a measurement, uh, and that measurement introduces generates classical bits, uh, as I said, one or zero. And so Alice then has to transfer those bits to Bob. Uh, and Bob can use those bits to determine what operation to perform on his remaining qubit that belong to the bell pair. And uh, that will result in the quantum state that Alice wanted to transmit. And as I said, it's a very, very simple circuit uh, for doing this. Uh, there's a question of uh, how do you keep the exponential decay rate constant? So the uh, rate decays exponentially uh, as a function of distance, okay? And the idea that has been proposed by uh, quantum networking researchers is essentially to break up that long distance into a bunch of short distances such that the, the decay rate uh, is the same across each of these. But because these repeaters can store let's say bell pairs, uh, the constraint, uh, what constrains the entanglement rate is really just the worst link. Uh, and in this case, the worst link has this rate right here. Okay, what I'd like to do now is uh, to turn our attention to uh, uh, classical networks and sort of uh, compare this uh, to uh, what a quantum network looks like. And so what I'm going to be doing is sort of giving an overview, brief overview of the internet, uh, talking about network services and routing, uh, switch and router design, and contrasting it to what we would expect in a quantum network. Okay, so you can think of this as sort of like Internet 101. Uh, and so the Internet, first and foremost, as we know, is really it's a network of networks. Okay, it's, it's loosely hierarchical. Um, and uh, you can think about there, it, uh, much of it is public, um, but uh, you can also have, uh, you have private uh, networks that belongs to organizations. And we're really talking about the public internet, uh, what we use uh, for much of our daily, uh, uh, let's say, uh, access uh, to, uh, the internet. Um, there's a, a notion of a protocol, uh, and a protocol is what controls the sending and receiving of, of messages. And sort of standard examples of these are TCP and IP, um, HTTP, Skype, Ethernet, Wi Fi. Uh, there's a, a standard body that is. Uh, in charge of sort of developing 
and uh, deploying these uh, protocols. And so you have internet standards that are sort of presented in documents that are referred to as RFCs or requests for comments. Uh, the organization responsible for this is the Internet Engineering Task Force. Uh, and there's also sort of a research arm of this called the Internet Research Task Force. And in fact, I should mention that there is a working group on quantum networks that uh, are, is contained in this Internet Research Task Force. So let's look a, a little bit closer at network structure. Um, at the network edge, we have applications and hosts. Uh, we have a, a network core that uh, consists of routers. And as I said, it's really not just a single monolithic network, but it's a, a network of networks. And then you have access networks at the edge, and they can be either wired or wireless. Uh, most of you uh, undoubtedly have networks in your homes, probably based on Wi-Fi, and those would be examples of, of a, a wireless access network. So let's look at the network core. And this is a mesh of interconnected networks, um, let's say, uh, what I have here sort of uh, delineated uh, in the red. And the question comes up is how should data be transferred through this network? And over the years, there have been really two sort of major proposals. One uh, is to rely on circuit switching, where you dedicate a circuit let's say per call or per, let's say, pair of users uh, that want to transfer information with each other. And of course, the telephone network is the prime example of this. And the other, which is really forms the basis of the internet, is packet switching, where what you do is you take the data and you break it up into uh, discrete chunks, and then you send each of those chunks sort of uh, individually uh, through the network. Okay, so looking at circuit switching, uh, the idea there would be you'd have, let's say, a pair of users connect, uh, let's say, uh, with this red, and you they would reserve resources at all of let's say the routers, all of the links on the path between them. And so they would reserve link bandwidth, uh, they would reserve capacity at each of the switches. Uh, these resources would be dedicated to those users. And so they would get guaranteed performance, which is what we think of as associated with a circuit. And of course, in order to do this, you need to uh, do a call setup because uh, it, uh, before you can establish the circuit, you need to know that you can get all the resources uh, that are required at each of the network elements on the path. On the other hand, uh, with packet switching, uh, each end-to-end -end data stream is divided into packets. And uh, you might have two users, A and B, that are generating packets. And these packets end up sharing the network resources. And each packet uses the full link bandwidth when it's being uh, transmitted across, okay? And resources are used by, let's say, the users only as needed. Now, this can result in resource contention. And so it's possible you can get into a situation where the aggregate resource demand exceeds what's available. And in that case, that will generate congestions. Packets may have to be queued up waiting to use the link. Uh, and so that sort of brings up this uh, 
paradigm that which many of you have uh, heard of, uh, the store and forward paradigm, where packets essentially move one hop at a time. They move a hop, they wait until they have the resources on the link to the next uh, switch and, and so on and so forth. And so if we sort of contrast packet switching and circuit switching, suppose we have a 100 megabit per second link and each user requires 10 megabits per second when it's active. And each user is active 10% of the time. You can think of it, you're at your uh, iPad and you spend time thinking and then you make a query and you get a result and then you spend some think time thinking and so on. So let's look at what happens uh, under circuit switching. Well, if each user needs 10 megabits per second when active, then you circuit switching would support exactly 10 users because you'd have to uh, be concerned about the occasion when all 10 were active at the same time. Uh, if you add an 11th, there would, uh, the users wouldn't get enough resources uh, for their application. Uh, with packet switching, it's interesting. Uh, suppose that you have 35 users and uh, we can compute the probability that more than 10 will be active. And it turns out that in uh, with 35 users, that happens with probability that's less than 0. 0.0004. So essentially, it's on a rare occasion when uh, any of these users uh, would might notice uh, the presence of the other users. And so because of that, packet switching then really allows many more users uh, to use the network. So um, here's a, a poll question, uh, which has to do with uh, sort of uh, what it, packet switching is. Um, uh, Mateos, can you go ahead and put it up? Um, and there's a question that has come up about virtual circuits, and that's something that I'll I'll talk about uh, a bit uh, later on. Yeah. So with packet switching, the question is. Uh, you know, uh, essentially some of the characteristics of packet switching. Okay. So it turns out with packet switching that you don't need to set up a connection uh, before the communication starts. Although there are, um, you can sort of uh, create services that, that might require it, but that's not uh, necessary. And users, don't share the bandwidth at every instant. It turns out that uh, when you transmit a packet, you essentially give it the entire bandwidth on the link uh, while you're you're sending it. And in a, again, uh, you're not dividing up the bandwidth uh, uh, across active users. Um, but uh, last, uh, when a packet is transmitted, um, it does get the entire transmission. Okay, 
So uh, going on, um, I want to talk a little bit about internet structure. Um, as I mentioned, it's a, a network of networks. It's roughly hierarchical. And what you have at the center are what are often referred to, referred to as tier one internet service providers. Uh, examples like Comcast or Verizon or AT&T. And they will produce national, provide national or international coverage. They treat each other as equals. Uh, and what they will do is they'll interconnect and they'll sort of peer privately and they'll essentially allow uh, with the peering arrangement, it, it will allow users connected to different networks to be able to sort of traverse this backbone. Uh, you then have sort of at the next level, uh, tier two internet service providers, uh, often they're regional ISPs, and they will connect to one or more uh, tier one ISPs, and they may even connect to other tier two ISPs. And what a tier two ISP will do is it will have a contract with, uh, let's say, a tier one ISP uh, where it pays for connectivity to the rest of the internet. And so you can think of the tier two ISP as a customer of the tier one provider. And then you at, uh, lower down in the hierarchy, you could have even smaller tier three ISPs. and they could be connecting to tier two ISPs. And again, they're customers to the higher tier ISPs that uh, connect them to the rest of the internet. And you can think of it that these three tier one ISPs then are sort of acting as a backbone for the entire network. And so if you have two users that are exchanging data, uh, uh, between themselves, uh, let's say uh, through packets, then a packet will traverse many networks. And I'm sure some of you have done trace routes and, and seen that as a result of the trace route. Okay, that's something we'll come back to when we talk about quantum networks. Um, there is a, typically, uh, for pedagogical reasons, and it also it's helpful in terms of engineering to think of, uh, let's say, a layered architecture for the internet and uh, that you have a, an internet protocol stack, uh, which I've uh, shown here. Uh, starting from the top, you have an application layer, which is supporting network applications, or you know, maybe it's supporting web, uh, uh, queries uh, using HTTPS or uh, let's say uh, uh, voice calls using the session in initiation protocol, SIP, and so on. Below that resides a, a transport layer, which is concerned with host-to-host -host data transfer. And here the two most prevalent protocols are TCP uh, and UDP. And UDP is a, is a pure, if you want, you can think of as a packet protocol that you just send packets in and uh, come what may, uh, they, uh, they may or may not make it through. At the, uh, below that is a network layer concerned with routing of packets from source to destination. Uh, it includes the internet protocol, which is really the glue that allows interconnection among all of these different networks that I mentioned in the previous slides. And then it includes, of course, routing protocols. And uh, below that, you have a, a, a link layer, which uh, is concerned with uh, doing the data transfer between neighboring network elements. And there are several protocols there. And then finally, at below that is the physical layer, which is really how bits are encoded on the wire. So with this in mind, let's uh, turn to uh, quantum networks. 
Um, and, and again, I'll just remind you the challenge that comes up with a, a quantum network is that the, uh, the probability that, let's say, a photon or pair of photons that are encoding your qubit uh, make it across a link of some distance L, it decays exponentially as a function of L. And, and as I said before, uh, we can't make uh, copies. And so what that has led to is this idea of, of quantum repeaters, which I had mentioned uh, before, where what you do is you set up a node, let's say in the middle, so now the distances have been halved between the repeater and the end nodes. And then uh, you only have to worry about uh, loss occurring across each link. And the rate that you can get across each link is uh, essentially given by exponentially decaying as a function of L over two rather than L. And so you get an increase in the rate and you can sort of take this uh, by, uh, you can improve on this by adding more and more repeaters. And so this gives rise to, you know, a, a repeater chain. And I want something that I want to mention is these repeaters, the idea is that they have lots and lots of memory. And it turns out it's mathematically, it's be, if you have infinite memory, that's what gives you a distance independent entanglement rate uh, given by this. And when I say distance uh, in, independent is as I increase L, I'm going to increase the number of repeaters so that the ratio of the distance over the number of repeaters remains constant, okay? On the other hand, and it's worth uh, pointing out, if you don't have a lot of memory at, at let's say each of these repeaters, and let's say, for example, you only have one memory, then it turns out that you don't get this nice distance independent behavior and that you end up still having an exponential decay in the entanglement rate as a function of L. So uh, this is uh, all sort of uh, can be shown mathematically, but in order to get this kind of behavior, uh, distance independence, uh, you don't need a lot of memory. Uh, and you, you essentially will get uh, uh, practically uh, distance independent. Okay. Uh, we can think of, uh, let's say, we can take a layered approach to, let's say, the quantum internet. There have been several uh, let's say, layered uh, stacks that have been proposed. Here's one that comes from a group at uh, TU Delft uh, that's headed by Stephanie Wiener. Um, and it is sort of is analogous to that for the uh, classical internet. You have an application layer at the top, which are essentially um, protocols that support the network applications, the application could be like a, one of the quantum key distribution algorithms, or it could be for distributed quantum computing. Below that, you have a transport layer, which would be concerned with, let's say, host-to-host -host quantum data transfer. And although they don't exist yet, you could think of it that maybe eventually there'll be a a quantum TCP and a quantum UDP. Below that is a network layer and the network layer would be responsible for entanglement generation 
between the end nodes. Okay, and because you will expect, uh, it's likely that the quantum internet will consist of uh, uh, connections of several quantum networks. Uh, we're probably going to need some kind of quantum internet protocol. And then we need, of course, uh, protocols for selecting the paths. Below that is a, a link layer, uh, which is going to be concerned with, you know, how do you generate link level entanglement? Uh, I think if you sat in on some of the classes uh, yesterday, we're talking about, uh, let's say, some of the algorithms that were proposed there. And then finally below that would just be photons on the wire or photon qubits, encoded qubits uh, on the wire. And I'll just leave this by pointing out that at this point in time, there does not exist a, a standard yet. Uh, there have been several proposals uh, uh, beyond just uh, the one that has come out of TU Delft. And in fact, that's one of the charges of this Internet Research Task Force on quantum networking is to try to develop, uh, let's say, uh, what the layered stack should look like and what the protocol should look like in each of these uh, layers. Okay, um, I'd like to turn now to reliability, uh, to the problem of dealing with noise or loss. And let's start with uh, reliable communications in, in the classical uh, network. Uh, first of all, the error model here is uh, you could have bit flips, you could have erasures. Um, these are typically dealt with at the link layer or the physical layer. Uh, what is uh, prominent in the internet is that packets can be dropped. Uh, we saw with this packet switching paradigm, it's possible to have congestion uh, at a router where you have to queue up packets. And if you have, let's say, a finite amount of memory, uh, then as soon as that memory gets full and a new packet comes, it will get dropped. And so um, I'm going to focus on that just a little bit. Uh, how do you deal with uh, errors? Uh, well, if it's bit flips and erasures, there's been a lot of work on error detection correction codes. Uh, uh, with drop packets, the uh, idea here, of course, is to uh, do packet retransmission. Once you detect that a packet has been dropped, the transmitter or the sender will then just uh, retransmit a copy. And, you know, it's, of course, important to notice here is that that relies on cloning. And so that means that something like a packet retransmission scheme isn't going to uh, be uh, extendable to a quantum uh, network. Uh, here I'm just showing uh, a, a, uh, an example of, let's say, packet retransmission. Uh, we have a sender and a receiver. The uh, sender sends a packet. A receiver gets it. The receiver then will send an acknowledgement back to the sender. And then the sender, let's say, uh, sends the next packet. And suppose it gets lost. It gets dropped at some router. Well, the sender, every time that it sends a packet, will set a, a, a timer. And so the, once the timer expires for packet one, then the sender will 
recognize that there's been a, a packet drop and it will just resend uh, the packet to the receiver. And the receiver, once it gets it, sends a NAC, and this just continues in the following way. So what happens in the quantum world? So the quantum challenge is that qubits are not self-protected against small perturbations, okay? In the classical world, you have a zero and a one uh, you and nothing else. And so you may have some sort of encoding for it and maybe it, get, it gets messed up a little bit and, and moves to here. Uh, but you can then recognize that uh, because uh, the distance between this and zero is much smaller than between zero and one, uh, this and one, that this must uh, be a zero and you can correct it. And so it's easy to sort of restore, uh, let's say classical bits when they sort of wander off a little bit. Unfortunately, that's not the case with a quantum bit because if you've taken the, the courses, uh, you know that uh, there, it's no longer discrete that you can have a superposition of the zero one and there's essentially a count, uncountable number of these superpositions. And so you might have a particular quantum state and if it wanders off just a little bit, uh, you don't know whether that wasn't the correct state or whether it actually uh, is sort of a noisy version of the previous state. Um, one of the uh, related to this is uh, when qubits are stored in memory, they have limited coherence time. Uh, you could have sort of a qubit technology where uh, you have a ground state that corresponds to, let's say, state zero and uh, an excited state, which corresponds to state one. And as time goes on, this excited state is going to want to try to jump back down to the ground state. And so as time goes on, this one it will be sort of trying to, to move back down to a zero. And so I show it here in, in this graph where uh, we're looking at time as uh, on the x-axis and then one and zero on the y-axis. Uh, the qubit starts off in state one. And then what happens is that uh, over time, it essentially sort of moves into a superposition between zero and one. Uh, but as time goes on, where there's greater and greater amplitude associated with zero until finally uh, it has essentially transformed into state zero. So how do we deal with this, let's say, in a network where we're generating bell pairs or bell states. And we can deal with it by using, uh, performing what's uh, referred to as entanglement purification. Here I show two nodes. Now you can think of it as Alice and Bob, although they're not labeled. And they share three bell pairs, okay? And these bell pairs, let's say because of noise uh, are, are not perfect. And so uh, purification essentially uh, corresponds to a, sort of a, a, a protocol that you can apply to those three where you'll measure off, uh, you'll perform some logic, you'll measure off two of them and then at the end, you'll have one remaining bell pair, which you can prove is higher quality than uh, 
any of the three above. Now, with many of these protocols, uh, this is probabilistic. Uh, and so there may be some non-zero probability that you'll have to throw this uh, bell pair away. But uh, that's something you can determine. And if you don't have to throw it away, uh, you're guaranteed that it will be higher quality than any of the three up here. And I'll just give you, this is a very, very, one of the earliest purification protocols uh, that is run on two bell pairs. Uh, one I'll call the source and another one called the target pair. And what Alice and Bob do is perform uh, c naught operations and then measures off uh, on each side the target uh, pair qubits. And that will, of course, generate a classical bit. And the, they exchange these classical bits. And it turns out that if they both measure a one, or they both measure a zero, they are guaranteed that the remaining bell pair will be higher quality than it was than either of the two were before. But there's also a probability that they will measure different values. And in that case, they have to throw away the source pair. And so it's a probabilistic, uh, uh, sort of uh, purification. Now, how do you go about sort of measuring this or evaluating this? Uh, there is a notion of, of fidelity. And you can think of fidelity, it's a measure of closeness of, let's say, an entangled pair to perfection. So if we have a bell pair, if its fidelity is one, then it's exactly what we what I've written down. It's a zero zero equal superposition of zero zero and one one. But as it strays from that, the fidelity decreases uh, uh, to zero. And what uh, purification does is it essentially takes two of these bell pairs or more than two uh, and outputs one that if the purification step succeeds, that uh, bell pair will have higher fidelity than before. And so here's a graph uh, to sort of try to show what I mean. Suppose that you have two bell pairs uh, and they have initial fidelity given on the x-axis. Then if you perform purification using the circuit that I showed you uh, previously, uh, you will transform those two into a single bell pair that has a fidelity given by the blue Curve, and notice that it's above the diagonal. And so that means that its fidelity is larger than what the initial fidelity was. But the red curve here is indicating the probability that it will succeed. And this probability is always less than one. And so if we take, let's say, an initial fidelity of 0.7, then it will succeed with a probability a little less than 0.6. But if it does, then the uh, output bell pair will have a fidelity that will be like 0.85. It'll be closer to ideal. Okay, so let me go back to the linear repeater network. Okay, and we have Alice and Bob. We've got a bunch of repeaters in between. And what we have here is a link uh, 
where that consists of a bunch of modes. If you want, you can think of it that there are a bunch of different frequencies in the optical fiber connecting Alice to this repeater and the, the pairs of repeaters. And so each time that uh, a link attempts to generate a bell pair, it attempts to generate it across each of these modes, okay? Now, suppose the probability of successfully generating a link level bell pair is P naught, uh, let's say given by this right here. And what you can do is uh, you can calculate the probability that at least one link level bell pair is generated across this link. And that's going to be given by uh, this expression right here. It just comes from the fact that this is a binomial distribution. Uh, one minus P naught is the probability that you don't succeed to the power M. Uh, if you have M uh, modes, it's the probability that you, none of them succeed. And one minus that is the probability you get at least one. And so, this will increase the link success probability P, but the, at the same time, whenever uh, if you generate multiple link level bell pairs, uh, that provides you the opportunity for doing purification. And so what you might end up with, let's say after one time step, is a bunch of successfully generated bell pairs across the links with a fidelity, let's say F naught. You can then purify them. And that will essentially give you uh, link level bell pairs that have a larger fidelity than before. And so this brings up really interesting questions that are still being pursued. And that is, you know, when and how much should you purify? Um, I've shown you purification at the link level, uh, but you could now also purify, uh, you could have essentially done uh, uh, swaps at the different nodes and created, let's say, two uh, bell pairs between these two uh, repeaters, and then you, and like what, and then you could have uh, done purification across, let's say, two links. And so there are questions about, you know, should you do it at individual links? Should you do it at multiple links? Um, uh, Suppose that the application has a minimum end-to-end -end fidelity constraint, then you know what's the best thing to do? And one thing I should point out is that when you perform logic at these repeaters, uh, that introduces some noise. And so if you want to counteract the gate noise uh, at the repeaters, you, you will also need to do purification between Alice and Bob. Okay, so um, here I have, uh, let's, I wanna introduce a poll question, which is really, you know, what's the purpose of purification? Uh, are we doing it to try to increase the entanglement uh, generation rate? Are, or are we, doing this to try to increase fidelity or does it allow us to increase the distance to, over which we can do entanglement distribution or does it uh, is it uh, bad does it uh, does it do we use it to increase generation rate 
there's an interesting question. I'll, I'll get to it. Okay, yeah, so I think uh, most uh, uh, people of, uh, see that it's really being used to increase uh, fidelity. Uh, it's interesting, uh, I, I see that uh, there are several answers on that it increases the distance of entanglement distribution. And you could think of that as, that's also a sort of an indirect consequence. Suppose that you wanted to maintain a minimum average fidelity uh, between Alice and Bob. Uh, then it's possible as you increase the distance between them that uh, the fidelity might go down uh, and that at some point you'd go below that minimum. And in which case uh, you might want to introduce purification for the purpose of, of making the uh, fidelity larger so that you could extend the distance. So, so that's not unreasonable. Uh, I noticed there's a, a question, uh, what about the decoherence process in the memory? In practice, can a, a high number of repeaters be bad? And that's an interesting question uh, because what as you have more and more repeaters and you're waiting to generate let's say link level bell pairs so that you can do perform these swaps in the repeaters as time goes on you're going to have to hold on to uh, a bell pair let's say across a link in memory at the repeaters uh, possibly for a very long time before you can perform that swap. And, and in that case, uh, that could be really uh, bad for performance. That would be something that would be a consequence of the fact that you had very, very few memories. Uh, if you had many memories, uh, then it turns out that there are ways that you can combat that and uh, and I'll be talking a little bit about that uh, later on. <clears throat> okay, so, <clears throat> excuse me. So uh, in terms of coming back to, let's say classical networks, uh, uh, the network layer I want to look at it, it uh, its functions are that uh, it transports packets from sending to receiving hosts. And so you have to have network layer protocols in every host and in every router. And it really has three important functions. Yet you have to select the route between the, the source and destination. Uh, that's the uh, function of a routing algorithm. Uh, you need to switch uh, at the routers, uh, essentially move packets from router input to appropriate router output. And then some network architectures may also require a call setup phase uh, before you can uh, have the data flow. So looking at network service, uh, what, uh, what uh, the service that the network uh, layer could provide, uh, that's really a crucial question, and it comes down to you. You know, do, what what does the user need? Uh, do you need guaranteed bandwidth? Uh, do you need to have, let's say, preservation of interpacket uh, inter packet timing. In other words, like jitterless delivery, uh, loss free delivery, in order, um, and so on, and so. This is really the, the most important abstraction provided by the network layer. And in the internet, uh, it's either you know, a virtual circuit or a datagram. And so let me just quickly go through these. Okay, With a virtual circuit, uh, essentially you want the source to destination path to behave like a telephone circuit. 
uh, performance wise, possibly, and, and it means that the network actions along the source to destination path will have to uh, uh, reflect that. And uh, you would need a call setup and tear down for each call. Uh, uh, typically, each packet would carry a, a virtual circuit identifier, not the destination host ID, so that the router knows uh, which virtual circuit it belongs to and, and what it needs to do to, to handle it. Uh, every router then would be uh, maintaining state for each of the passing connections. And uh, you might allocate link and router resources then to, to the virtual circuit. Uh, and you would have to if you wanted to have get uh, circuit like performance. So it would behave like this. You'd initiate a call of uh, the receiver would get that uh, and decide to accept the call that would go back to the sender, call is connected, and then the data could begin to flow through the network to the receiver. Um, the other kind of service, uh, a datagram service is really what the internet model is all about. And here, there's no call set up at the network layer. Routers don't maintain any state about end-to-end -end connections. There's no network level concept of connection. And if you're at all puzzled, TCP is a connection-oriented protocol, but TCP runs at the transport layer. It runs between the end hosts, not between the end uh, nodes, uh, the let's say the end routers at, at uh, in the uh, network, um, packets would typically be routed using destination host ID, and it's possible that packets between the same source destination pair could take different paths. Okay, as I sort of show here. So how about in the quantum world? What, what service model might we have here? Um, you know, do we want to guarantee a rate? Do we want to provide a latency guarantee, a minimum fidelity guarantee? Uh, and it seems to me the most important abstraction that a quantum network uh, layer would provide would be uh, are we entang uh, just generating and entangling and distributing entanglement, or are we providing a service of transferring quantum information from uh, a sender to a receiver? And so let's quickly look at these. We've been talking about entanglement distribution, so there's nothing really going to be new here. Uh, basically, what the network is concerned with is creating and distributing bell pairs, let's say to users. Uh, and it then a pair of users can use teleportation if it needs to transfer quantum information uh, between themselves. Then this is going to rely heavily on purification to handle noise. And because we know that swaps are really nothing more than teleportation. It requires a lot of the exchange of a lot of classical information for sort of correcting. So let's stop here for just a, a poll question on I uh, want to sort of go back to quantum teleportation and uh, and sort of think about what its purpose for. Is it to correct errors or is it to transport classical information or to transport quantum information? Or is it really intended to transport a human being from spaceship to a planet? Actually, it was interesting. Uh, 
Pro uh, Professor Raymer uh, mentioned that in his course. And initially, he uh, s s talked about it as if maybe it could be possible, except that you would need so many bell pairs and you'd have to have such a large uh, classical communication exchange. And then afterwards he said, no, uh, it wasn't possible. Uh, my guess is the verdict is, is still out. Right. So uh, most of you, almost all of you got it, that it's really, it uses a bell pair to aid in transporting a quantum state from one node to another. It, it's interesting, uh, several of you uh, said it's used to transport classical information. And I'll just mention that there is a protocol that's somewhat like uh, quantum teleportation, uh, it, uh, which is, uh, what is it, super dense coding protocol that uh, is used to, to, in fact, send classical information. Okay. Uh, So the other service would be uh, to just, uh, the network would just deliver quantum information from let's say Alice to Bob. And this is referred to as a one-way network architecture. And I'll, I'll tell you why. And here the, uh, the idea is you're just gonna transfer the quantum information directly. You have some quantum state sign not, and then all you're doing is you're, transferring it through the network to the receiver. And it's worth noting that this is what a classical network does. And so you might expect that there's a lot that could be borrowed from classical network uh, to be able to, let's say, design, implement, and deploy this kind of a service. Um, it relies very heavily on the use of quantum error correction. And it's understood that at this point, uh, it may be possible to design and build a network that distributes bell pairs, but that we're many years away from being able to provide the quantum error correction needed to uh, let's say, provide this kind of a service. Um, on the positive side, it doesn't require the exchange of classical information. And, and so that's uh, a benefit. And I should point out, these services are interchangeable. You know, you can use quantum teleportation to transfer quantum information. And if your network transfers quantum information, then you, Alice can generate the bell pair and transfer one of those qubits to Bob. And so we can think of eventually, we're gonna have a quantum internet where quantum information is gonna pass through many networks. There'll be end-to-end -end entanglement over many networks. Uh, and the challenge is gonna be that some internet service providers may distribute entanglement, others may transmit quantum information. Uh, so you might have a setting like this. Uh, the other, another challenge is that you could use very different technologies for these uh, networks uh, as well. And so if we compare one way to two way, uh, the pros of two way is that purification is simpler than quantum error correction. Uh, bell pairs are fungible, which is uh, interesting. And that's what uh, is useful when you have quantum repeaters. 
that uh, you know you, you can swap any pair of bell pairs. Uh, uh, you don't have to wait for a specific bell pair. And, and that also allows for the possibility that even if there's no demand, you the network can generate entanglement and essentially store it near the users. And, and so it also tolerates noisy gates. Uh, the downside is you have larger latencies because you have this classical communication and you have high memory requirement at the repeaters. Uh, for one way, uh, the pros are there's no classical comms, you have very low memory requirement, and the cons are that it looks to be very, very challenging to do quantum error correction, and that it's going to require high quality gates. So last poll sec uh, question for this section, uh, and that is just to sort of list uh, the advantages uh, of, uh, let's say, two-way quantum network architecture. This is the one where you have uh, classical comms and you're distributing entanglement. And I see that uh, Mateos has been responding to some of the questions as we've been going along. Okay. Right. Right. So of, of what I had listed, the the two advantages that I was looking for is uh, it turns out it can deal with noisy quantum gates. And for that reason, or that's one of the reasons it's, it's expected to be the first service, first architecture that will be deployed. And uh, unfortunately, it requires considerable quantum memory. So I think of that as a, a disadvantage. And a disadvantage is that it, it introduces latencies because of classical communication. Um, and because it uh, provides a fungible resource, uh, it's expected to provide high rates. Okay, so uh, we're getting near the end. I want to talk a little bit about routing in the classical uh, network here. The goal of a routing protocol is to determine a good path uh, uh, from source to destination through the network. Uh, and for this, uh, we rely on a graph abstraction where the graph nodes are routers and graph edges are physical links and that we have link costs could be delay or could be monetary cost, could be congestion level. Uh, we think of a, a good path, meaning that let's say uh, for Al between Alice and Bob, a, a minimum cost path, but other definitions are possible. And the workhorse here is uh, Dijkstra's algorithm for finding the shortest uh, path. And uh, routing algorithms, there are a couple of ways that you can go about classifying them. You know, are they global or do they use decentralized uh, information? Uh, in the case where they're global, you can think of it as a central controller that has complete uh, information about the graph, about the costs. Uh, and in fact, this is sort of the premise behind software defined networking. On the other hand, a decentralized approach might require a router to just know who its neighbors are and the link costs to those neighbors. And then uh, in order to compute a good route, uh, you'd 
it would undergo some iterative algorithm where it does some computation, exchanges results with neighbors, uh, eventually ending up with, let's say, the best path. Uh, we can also ask or classify routers as being static or dynamic. Uh, it's static uh, uh, would be where the routes change very, very slowly over time, could be on the period of hours or even longer. And dynamic might have routes changing more quickly, uh, where we have frequent updates uh, in the routing tables, let's say in response to link cost changes. And I'll just say in, in the current classical approach, uh, typically it's, uh, you can think of it logically as if there's a central controller with complete topology uh, and link cost information that's running Dijkstra's algorithm or some related algorithm. And this is sort of what's behind software defined networking. Uh, the algorithms are much more complicated than just finding shortest paths. Uh, it, they include policy constraints like, let's say, party A cannot use some set of links, uh, calculation of backup paths in the event of a failure. Uh, providing some diversity for the purpose of doing load balancing. And with quantum routing, uh, there's been a lot of papers that have been written on possible uh, routing algorithms. And I'm not going to dwell much on routing in the quantum network, but uh, there's been a lot of work on static algorithms, and again, they tend to be shortest path algorithms with link costs. Uh, there are some papers that have taken the, the cost to be, let's say, the inverse of the entanglement rate for the link, or uh, others use fidelity for that link, and uh, so on. Some work on dynamic algorithms where each node chooses neighbors essentially to connect to based on just local state information that it has about its neighbors. Okay, and uh, I want to say, uh, talk just a little bit about routers in, in quantum switches. Um, here's the architecture overview for a, a classical router. Uh, it has serves two functions. It has to run routing algorithms in the protocol. And then otherwise it has to forward packets from an incoming to an outgoing link. So a router would consist of some high speed switching fabric, um, a bunch of uh, router input ports, a bunch of router output ports, and basically the routing processor determines for uh, you know, what, uh, uh, based on the destinations associated with packets, you know, a, a packet in this input port, which of the output ports should it go to? Okay, and in the classical world, the challenges that are faced have to do with, you know, how do you evaluate performance of these routers? What are the right scheduling policies? There's been a lot of work on matching algorithms, uh, max weight policies, lightweight uh, randomized algorithms. Uh, don't worry about what these are. I'll talk a little bit about them in the quantum uh, setting. So going to the quantum, uh, we have quantum switches and they're gonna have quantum memories uh, that can be loaded from the interfaces and read out to the interfaces, uh, the ability to perform multi-bit quantum measurements. Um, there's going to have to be quantum logic qubits, a, a quantum logic that can be applied across the qubits held in the quantum memories. Uh, there will be the need to be able to generate ancilla photons. Uh, uh, to generate ancillary qubits, and then, of course, uh, classical computing and communications. Beyond sort of a schematic like this, um, 
these the switches have not really been created yet so it's hard to know exactly what their architectures are, are going to be and so if we look at a quantum switch okay it's going to have a bunch of let's say users connected to it uh, user pairs are going to generate requests for bell pairs then the links will randomly generate bell pairs and, and then following that the switch has to select which bell pairs to swap. And you can think of it that there's sort of a graph uh, associated with all of the bell pairs where uh, the nodes correspond to successfully created bell pairs and the edges correspond to uh, bell pairs that can be swapped to satisfy some request. And then you have to decide which ones that corresponds to selecting a, a matching in a graph like that. And, and the output of a swap matching then is uh, once you do the swaps are entanglements between the end nodes. Okay, and so the challenges that we have here then are, you know, what's the right design for the switch? What should the switching fabric look like? What should the teleportation fabric look like? Uh, how do we evaluate the performance of, of these networks? Um, how should we do uh, resource allocation? And, uh, you know, there's a lot to be said that maybe we should do virtual circuit switching here. Um, how do we handle uh, noise? Uh, deal with, uh, let's say, uh, uh, quality of service requirements. <clears throat> and uh, I'm going to skip this. And I'm going to stop here before we go on to our next step. Uh, and so let's take about a five minute break. Uh, and in the meantime, if there are any questions, I can answer them. Mateus, are, are there any questions that I haven't really paid attention to? Yeah, Dan, I guess I answered most of them. There are some open questions that I think you might want to address live, possibly. So uh, uh, there's an open, there are open questions. There's okay. Should I just go start at the beginning? Yes. Okay. So there's a question: Does the information about shared entanglement stored in the repeater also decrease over time? Um, I'm not quite sure what is meant by that. Uh, my what I think of it is. If I store entanglement in repeater, there are two things. One, I know where it's stored and I know, uh, uh, let's say, when I use it. Uh, decoherence, of course, will reduce the quality, decrease the fidelity of that entanglement. And so uh, it has been suggested that you might want to have a cutoff policy where after you've stored it for some amount of time, uh, after that, you just throw it away because you expect its fidelity to be uh, pretty uh, bad, pretty poor. The exponential decay simply reflects quantum mechanical tunneling and that had to do with my model of decoherence. Uh, I'm not a physicist, so I don't hold me to this. I think you're right, but I'm not positive. I, I think you would, we would need to consult with somebody like uh, Professor Raymer from uh, yesterday. And I believe I answered yes. uh, the question uh, on can a high number of repeaters be bad? 
Um, and actually, I'm not a co-author on that book, although I was uh, certainly involved in preparing a bunch of the lectures before that book came into being, uh, because I used to teach with Professor Carosa. Um, we'll, uh, the question is, what's the book we're talking about? And we can look that up. And uh, what I'll do is when uh, Mateos is speaking, I'll look it up and I'll uh, chat it. Okay, so distributing quantum entanglement, I think of that what the network is doing is all it wants to do is generate an entangled pair that it distributes to Alice and Bob. And Alice and Bob don't need to, uh, and the way that it does it is it builds it up from uh, generating link level entanglement, uh, performing swaps so that that the, that link entanglement essentially grows into an end-to-end -end entanglement between Alice and Bob. The quantum information transfer is that Alice has a quantum state, uh, it could be multiple qubits that she wants to send to Bob and that all the network is concerned with is delivering that state from Alice to Bob. And what it will do is it will have to go across a path to Bob through a series of switches. And because of the amount of noise uh, that will be present, uh, it's understood that each logical qubit that Alice is sending to Bob is going to require a large number of physical qubits to be used as part of an error correction code. Okay. And as I said, the two are interchangeable. If Alice and Bob have a bell pair, then Alice can always teleport a quantum state to Bob. And if Alice and Bob want a bell pair, then Alice can create it and then transfer the second qubit through the network to Bob. Okay. Okay. So let me go on to the second section. And this is going to be more technical. And one thing uh, I think it's important uh, to understand. Uh, so I sat in on Professor Raymer's class and I sat in uh, uh, Professor Kilper's class and they, you know, Professor Raymer talked about a well-established theory and how it might be used uh, for quantum networking. Professor Kilper talked a lot about, you know, how you build uh, a optical network, what the architecture is, and all based on, let's say, decades of work, uh, of research and engineering. Here, there doesn't exist a quantum network. Uh, in fact, it's not, to be honest, it's not clear when we will really have like our first quantum network. And so in some sense, much of what we're gonna be talking about is has to do with problems that we perceive as will be important uh, to address uh, for these uh, coming quantum networks. And what I'm gonna talk about now is really performance of quantum networks, uh, resource allocation problems that uh, have to be addressed, okay? And so uh, here's sort of the outline of what I'm going to talk about. And one of the things that I'm going to be sort of pointing out is this is all sort of theoretical. And uh, in red, I'm sort of pointing out the kinds of techniques that uh, researchers are using to sort of address 
these different problems. I'm not going to go into them in any detail, but I just want you to understand that there's a lot of sort of mathematics and varied mathematics that will be important for sort of uh, solving these problems. And so I, what I'd like to do is uh, to start off looking at a single quantum switch. It's the simplest network that we can think of and ask questions about, you know, what, uh, what's the capacity? At what rate can it generate entangled bell pairs to, let's say, the users attached to it? And how do we allocate resources among pairs of users? Okay, and so we have a switch here on the right uh, with a bunch of end nodes and uh, connected through quantum channels. And as I said, how do we achieve the best performance uh, when we have multiple source sync pairs attached uh, to this switch? And we're going to be concerned with the capacity region of this uh, switch, which I'm gonna make sort of more precise. And think of it, we have these users and they're generating requests for bell pairs. And these requests arrive to the switch, okay? And mathematically, let's think of it that there's an infinite amount of memory. Um, think of it that there's just a large amount of memory from an engineering perspective. And the rates are given by these lambdas. So the rate at which, let's say, node one and node two make requests for bell pairs, it's lambda one, two. Uh, node one and node three, it's lambda one, three, and so on and so forth. And I want to introduce the notion of stability. Okay. And I'm going to say, this quantum switch is stable if the delays between when a request are made and satisfied are finite, okay? If you want, you can think of that they don't have, wait like huge amounts of time in order uh, to get their request fulfilled. And then we can talk about a capacity region and uh, and what a capacity region is, it's the set of request rate vectors for all of the pairs of users uh, such that if the switch were presented with those rates, uh, it could be stabilized, that all of the user pairs would get their requests uh, uh, served in a finite amount of time, okay? And there are two sides to this story. Um, the uh, if you have a request uh, uh, rate vector that falls outside of the region, then uh, it's unstable. And what I'm doing here is I'm drawing a very simple uh, rate capacity region where we just have two request streams. Uh, one with rate R1, one with rate R2. And this red curve here delineates the capacity region. And so if the request rates fall outside, uh, it's unstable. The delays uh, by when they get satisfied, they're just going to go to infinity. But if it lies inside, then what we want is to design a scheduling algorithm that will stabilize uh, uh, the re this uh, request rate pair, okay? And by scheduling algorithm, I, what I mean is, you know, who, who are you going to swap? So the model, and this is sort of a very standard model that's been used in classical uh, switch analysis is that time is slotted and, and what happens in each slot is, first of all, you generate entanglement, uh, let's say size 0k uh, between uh, user k and the switch, uh, 
And it's successfully generated with some probability P sub K. Okay, and uh, with one minus P sub K, it, uh, there's a failure. And then once you've generated the entanglement, you decide what swaps to do. And what you'll do is you'll create a, a bell pair between uh, I and J with a probability Q by consuming link bell pairs between uh, the switch and I and switch and J. Okay, and so the sw uh, swapping here is probabilistic. Okay, and then we have entanglement requests uh, at each slot. There's some number of requests that arrive uh, for let's say between uh, user pair I and J and with arrival rates that are given by lambda I J and you can think of it uh, the following has to be true uh, in order to be able to be stable uh, uh, you can't have on average more requests being generated uh, for a, uh, a link than the rate at which you can generate um, um, uh, link entanglements. And I realize I have a, a mistake. I'm curious to see if I can annotate and I'll just correct it. Uh, this should be P sub J. Okay, the rate at which uh, a link can generate entanglement, oh, excuse me, P sub I, that it can generate entanglement successfully is P sub I. And so the average number of requests for that had better be less than P sub I. And you can interpret lambda I J then as a probability that let's say a bell pair is requested in a slot without uh, any loss. Okay, and so I've indicated that there. And we're gonna assume memory is perfect, no decoherence, error-free gates, infinite memory at switches and then nodes. And so here's what can be shown for stability. It turns, it's very easy to characterize the capacity of the switch. It turns out that if you have a set of, let's say, uh, lambda IJs, request rates, uh, if they satisfy this inequality, uh, then the, uh, it lies within the capacity region. And to give you sort of intuition as to what that means, uh, if you look at the expected number of swap attempts that you need to make before you have a successful swap uh, and for, let's say, a request from a user pair IJ, that's just going to be one over Q, okay? And if you look at the system for a long time, then roughly you're going to be uh, executing lambda ij times t over q swap operations. And each one of them is going to consume uh, one of these link uh, level uh, bell pairs. And so now if we sum over, let's say, all users that are using link J, then that has to be less than the number of uh, uh, link bell pairs that can be generated uh, over link J, which would be on average PJT uh, over time T. Okay, and so that just corresponds 
if you just uh, uh, remove the T, it corresponds to this inequality. Okay, so that's a characterization of the capacity region. Now the question is, uh, can we achieve that? And so it turns out there's a very simple resource allocation policy, uh, which uh, is referred to as the stationary resource allocation policy. And what you do is every time you generate a, a link level bell pair, uh, let's say between I and the switch, with a probability uh, Fij, which uh, I am uh, giving as this, uh, there's a, um, uh, you label it as uh, Ij. And then what happens is that every anytime you have, let's say, link level bell pairs uh, between I and the switch and J and the switch that are both labeled Ij, uh, then you swap them. And what will happen is after a long period of time T, you know, roughly P sub I T pairs of link level uh, entanglements are going to be generated. Um, and you're going to mark uh, essentially this number as belonging to user pair IJ. And it turns out that that's larger than the request rate for IJ times T. Uh, the same thing holds uh, for, let's say, the bell pairs between zero and J. And then when you swap and, and do the algebra, you get that uh, you are generating uh, the, the average number of bell pairs between I and J that you generate is, is given by uh, QFIJT. And because of the way you define FIJ, that's larger than what you needed. Okay. And I'll, I'll just say the, the proof that this algorithm is stable relies on something that's called Lyapunov stability theory. And uh, I'm not going to go into it, but it's a very powerful sort of uh, branch of, of math that's used for sort of characterizing and understanding stability in uh, classical and I think quantum networks. Uh, just one remark. Suppose that our request rates lie strictly in the capacity region. Then it turns out that on average, we're gonna have more pairs of the link level bell pairs that are gonna be marked as Ij, then uh, we need to fulfill the requests in, let's say, a time t. And so what we can do then is we're going to be generating an excess, and we can just store that excess at the end nodes uh, to serve uh, future requests. Uh, and so this is a way of essentially pre-sharing entanglement. And this allows the possibility of providing zero latency service. There, there's a, a couple of questions that came up. So this resource allocation policy is predicated on the switch knowing what the request rates are. And you can imagine uh, settings where it may not know, or, um, and not only where it may not know, but where the request rates may change over time. And I'm not going to go into it, but there have been a couple of other policies that have been proposed that are sort of robust to uh, 
having less information. I'll actually uh, refer to one of them in a couple of slides in a slightly different context. Okay, so before we go on, uh, I just want to check to see uh, if, if the concept of civility uh, sort of came through. Uh, and so here are alternate uh, characteristics or properties of a scheduling policy that stabilize the quantum switch of which one, one is correct, but not all of them. And so why don't you go ahead and take a few seconds to fill this out. Oh. <laughs> right. Uh, so uh, about 80% of you uh, answered that it uh, stability sort of is associated with uh, that uh, entanglement requests are served in a finite amount of time. And it turns out that by itself, stability says nothing about fidelity, although you can talk. Um, well, I'll say something uh, shortly. Okay, so let me go on. So I, I want to sort of uh, mention some extensions. Uh, we talked about the case where uh, there's no decoherence and we have infinite amount of memory. The other extreme is that let's say a qubit is only good for one time slot. And if you don't use it, then you will lose it. And I'll just say that there are results here for also characterizing the capacity region. Uh, I'm not presenting it because it turns out it's much more complicated than it is in the case where you have infinite memory. And one reason, uh, one nice thing about these two extremes is if, if you look at this graph here, again, just for the case of two request streams, uh, assuming, let's say, one memory per link and decoherence after one slot, that essentially gives you sort of the worst capacity. Uh, and assuming infinite memory and no decoherence gives you the best, and anything else will will sort of lie in between. And so there's a lot of work going on in trying to characterize uh, what's in between. Uh, for this particular setting, it turns out that there's a scheduling policy called the max weight policy that stabilizes the switch. And what do I mean by max weight? It's a, a matching that does the following. Pi i j, think of is matching, uh, uh, let's say, i to j. Q i j is the number of requests that are sort of waiting for uh, entanglement uh, uh, for user pair i j. And essentially, uh, the max weight policy is the one that maximizes this sum. Uh, right here. And this is a policy that, uh, going back to, I said that uh, the stationary policy assumes you know what request rates are. This one requires no knowledge of what the workload is. Okay, uh, so challenges uh, is, uh, I assume, perfect conditions. And so, one needs to deal with the fact you have noisy gates, you have decoherence in the memories. And I'll just uh, point you, there's some initial results. Um, I've talked about a single switch. And so all of this needs to be extended to a network setting. Um, 
then the characterization of the capacity region probably is straightforward, but I think uh, coming up with efficient scheduling algorithms is going to be very challenging. Uh, and then applications with different requirements. <clears throat> okay, so, so that's the first uh, uh, topic that I wanted to uh, talk about here. And now what I'd like to do is talk about how we might be able to address memory noise uh, in some of these, uh, let's say, designs and, uh, let's say, models. And I'm going to do this in the context of uh, teleportation. Okay. And so what we have is Alice and Bob. <clears throat> and Alice is, is getting, receiving requests for teleportation. And the requests consists of, let's say, a particular qubit or quantum state to be transferred, okay? And Bob and Alice are generating bell pairs because they are needed in order to, for Alice to perform a teleportation, okay? And so uh, these are sort of occurring randomly. And so there are times when Alice may generate qubits to be teleported, but there aren't any bell pairs to be used. And so Alice then has to uh, place the data qubits into memory. And so, for example, she might generate a data qubit that goes into memory. Uh, it starts to decohere. Uh, that's uh, this faded red is supposed to meant to uh, uh, indicate that. Uh, and it gen uh, Alice generates another qubit it wants to teleport. And then finally, there's a bell pair that's generated between Alice and Bob, uh, but the data qubits that need to be teleported have um, decohered a little bit more. Okay, so Alice teleports and Bob receives a slightly faded uh, qubit. Um, and so the question that we, we might ask is, you know, how should we schedule uh, bell pairs and data qubits? Going back here, here we had a choice of which data qubit to teleport. And, and so there's a question of uh, what I, I did here is I took the oldest one. And so, you know, should it be the oldest qubit first or should it be the youngest qubit first? How about when we have bell pairs, do we care how, which ones we use when we have a, a choice? And how should we manage the memory? Uh, if it can only can hold a finite number of qubits, uh, what do we do when it fills up? Do we discard an arrival? Do we discard the oldest entry, uh, which is, referred to as push out. And so I'd like to do that, uh, but let me start by talking about uh, a decoherence model for the memory. Uh, as we saw before, fidelity is the most widely used measure of degradation of a quantum state due to noise. And it turns out it's easy to compute for many noise models. Um, if we let T be the time that the quantum state spends in memory, you know, let's say a single qubit or a bell pair, and let T2 denote uh, memory decoherence time, um, which uh, I, I'm not going to define precisely, it, it turns out that it's easy to derive an expression for the fidelity of the qubit that spent time T in memory, and it has this nice exponential decaying form. Uh, it's A plus B times E to the minus T over T2, uh, where A plus B is equal to one. If T is equal to zero, then the fidelity is equal to one. And these constants depend on uh, the kind of noise, it depends on the kind of quantum state. 
and it depends on your quantum memory technology. Okay, and, and I'm not going to get into that. Okay, so now let me introduce a random variable, uh, t, uh, big T, which is the time the qubit spends in memory. Okay, and suppose it has a probability density function, f of t. Okay. And uh, one can define a Laplace transform associated with the probability density function. And it's just given by this expectation right here. Um, it's the expectation of e to the minus s times the random variable t, where s is just a, a parameter. Okay, and it's defined for s greater than or equal to zero. Okay, so what does this have to do with fidelity? Let me define and introduce another random variable, f, for fidelity. And what we saw from the previous slide is if f, if it's given, let's say, uh, uh, the fidelity for a qubit that's been in memory for t units of time, uh, it's just given by this exponentially decaying um, uh, expression. And what's worth noting is if you look at the exponential term, it looks a lot like what we have in this expectation for the Laplace transform. And so the average fidelity then is very easy uh, to calculate. Um, it's given by a plus b times this uh, integral. And that's just uh, given in terms of the Laplace transform of uh, the time that the qubit spends in memory. OK, so we'll see where this is going. So now let's look at the resource management part of, of this system. We have these bell pairs that are being generated, uh, let's say, a, a, we'll assume according to a Poisson process uh, and la with rate lambda and it's cached in memory. Uh, we have teleportation requests, which let's assume are generated according to a Poisson process with rate mu uh, and they're cached in memory, uh, except when you can do teleportation. Uh, and it turns out that the behavior of this system then can be described by what's called a continuous time Markov chain. And so for the case where you have a memory size B, you can think of it in the following way. The system is in one of many states. Zero corresponds to the case where there is no qubit to be teleported and no EPR pair, no bell pair. Uh, if you have a request for a teleportation, then that qubit gets stored in memory. And so you have one there. If you get another request, uh, then we now have two stored in memory and so on and so forth until we get up to uh, B. On the other hand, let's say we have two qubits uh, stored in memory that want need teleportation, uh, this corresponds to a transition where we generate a bell pair between Alice and Bob, and then we perform the teleportation, and, and we immediately uh, get rid of one of the qubits in memory. We go down to one. And so these transitions then correspond to what happened when we have bell pairs created. Uh, when we have qubits uh, to be teleported in memory, the, uh, the number decreased by one. And here, I'm using the negative sign to indicate that now we're storing bell pairs. Okay, and so putting it all together, continuous time Markov chains are very easy to solve. <clears throat> And 
and you can get the distribution for the number of occupied memories. And you can get the distribution the Laplace transform for the time that qubits reside in memory. I'm going to call that R prior to teleportation. And you can do it for lots of different scheduling policies and lots of different buffer management policies. And so then all you have to do is take the, uh, the decoherence model and, uh, and use this distribution and this Laplace transform to get the final fidelity of the teleported uh, qubit. There's a question, uh, if you're using slotted time steps to model a switch, um, I apologize. I Here, I'm not using a slotted uh, model. Uh, here, I'm just making the assumptions that uh, qubits to be teleported are generated uh, according to some process, and bell pairs are generated according to some process and then modeling in this sort of continuous time. Uh, but I'll just say that uh, you could treat this in a similar way using sort of a, a, a time slotted model. Okay, so just quick result, you know, suppose that the data to be teleported is being generated at rate lambda. Uh, Bell pairs are being generated at rate mu. Uh, I'm going to use lambda over mu uh, as a measure of the load on the system. Uh, suppose the initial entanglement fidelity is 0.9, and for the data qubits, it's 1. Uh, as uh, we saw, fidelity decays exponentially in time. Let's say we have a memory size of 10, and we're using these two policies, youngest qubit first and oldest qubit first. Okay. Here in the top graph, uh, we're, our independent variable is load, and we're looking at the average fidelity of the teleported qubit. And to the left of a load of one, that corresponds to the case where we're generating bell pairs faster than data qubits to be teleported, and to the right of one that we're generating data qubits faster than we can teleport them, in which case they're going to, some of them are going to be thrown out. And the blue curve is what you get when you use youngest qubit first. Um, the red curve is with oldest qubit first. And so we see that uh, for this system, we should always use the freshest bell pair or teleport the youngest data qubit that's in memory. And uh, it's interesting, you can prove that that's actually the best thing to do. Uh, in this bottom graph, we're just looking at what the teleportation rate looks like as a function of the request rate. And as you see, it doesn't go up as a straight line. Uh, we, we start to suffer some loss because of, of buffer memory overflow. Okay, so youngest qubit first with push out maximizes entanglement rate and average fidelity. Uh, uh, you could look at timeout schemes and, and they could be used to provide minimum fidelity guarantees. Uh, and so I, I want to end this with a polling question. Uh, and that is, again, sort of understanding, you know, why, let's say, a youngest qubit first is preferable in a quantum network. Yeah, that's an interesting question that Matthew brings up about differences in quantum networks for uh, that support uh, sensing versus uh, support quantum computing. Uh, and 
they both, uh, I believe, I think of as relying on the distribution of entanglement uh, in distributed quantum computing, you're going to have to be able to perform distributed operations like, let's say, a distributed C naught or a distributed Hadamard. And the only way to do that is either you move information to one site where you can, the inputs to one site where you can perform the operation or you can perform what's called gate teleportation, which is not that different from uh, quantum teleportation that we talked about, but it allows you to essentially uh, uh, teleport. Uh, uh, yeah, essentially, uh, you end up, uh, if you want, you can think of it teleporting one of the inputs to the other where the operation is performed. Okay, and so looking at the the answers, um, uh, the uh, answer is that it, uh, that it gives you the highest uh, fidelity, and that that's uh, really uh, how you get the sort of the larger average fidelity. The first answer that that's actually very interesting. It turns out that um, this is something that's well known in queuing theory, that if you have a scheduling policy or two scheduling policies, and they always schedule, let's say something, but they don't schedule the same, let's say entity, in our case, the same qubit, the average latency is unchanged, uh, but, but the variance uh, of, let's say, the latency can, can change. And so um, if the first question had been reduces the variance in the time to search a request, that would be correct. And it, I think often people sort of conflate uh, sort of variability with uh, the actual, uh, like the mean. Okay, um, what I'd like to do now is uh, just uh, some challenges. Uh, so this optimality youngest qubit first holds in this uh, teleportation setting. And it's interesting to ask whether that's a much more uh, universal uh, sort of uh, property of quantum networks. And the idea of using the simple Markov processes using Laplace transform you know, also raises the question of, can we look at more complicated network scenarios? And the model really just had, it really didn't model the generation of bell pairs. And so it's interesting to think about whether one can accommodate those as well. Okay, so what I'd like to do now is go to sort of the last topic that I, I'm going to uh, cover here, which uh, has to do with optimizing. Uh, flows, uh, let's say routes and, and swapping. And let's start with sort of a very simple example where we have a linear repeater chain. Uh, the Bell state measurements uh, do not always succeed. They succeed with some probability Q that's less than one. And I'm going to provide a sample schedule for generating end-to-end uh, -end bell pairs. And here the assumption is that each of the links generates link level bell pairs at rate lambda. And so one way that we could do it is when 
link level bell pairs are created between zero and one, one and two, one swaps. And that has the effect of sort of creating uh, bell pairs between zero and two at rate lambda Q because of the fact that swaps are not always successful. And then what two does is it always swaps those bell pairs with bell pairs between two and three. Okay, and uh, that's going to give uh, uh, entanglement uh, creation rate of lambda Q squared between zero and three. And three does the same thing. Okay, and I've shown it for uh, this particular order, but we could change the order in which this uh, happens and uh, you would uh, get the same thing. Uh, but what I'd like to point out is that we're getting an increase in the exponent on Q every time that we add a repeater. And so the capacity decays exponentially in the number of repeaters. Okay, so let's look at uh, another way that we could uh, schedule things. And that is that what we do is that one always swaps bell pairs between itself and zero and between itself and two. Three does the same thing, but for bell pairs between two and three and three and four. Okay. And then when two has bell pairs of this kind, it then does a swap. And in that case, uh, the entanglement generation rate is actually larger than it was with the previous. It turns out that you only suffer from sort of the effects of two swaps in terms of uh, the hit on the entanglement rate. And so if you have a path of length n, this nested entanglement uh, schedule is going to give you a rate that's lambda times q uh, to the power of the log of n. And that essentially corresponds to polynomial scheduling, uh, scaling. Okay. And so swap scheduling then uh, can affect performance here. Uh, on the other hand, it's worth noticing if swaps are deterministic, then it turns out we're, we're not going to get any difference between the two schedules. Uh, this difference occurs because swaps are probabilistic. Okay, so poll question. Um, on uh, the last uh, few slides, just uh, to see whether um, I got across uh, the, the primary ideas. And it really has to do when you have probabilistic swaps, you know, how does end-to-end -end entanglement rate depend on the number of repeaters? <clears throat> There's a the question about uh, that goes back to the graph that I showed with youngest qubit first and oldest qubit first, having to do with the dip. Um, I'll I'll come back to that when I'm done because uh, it's interesting. Okay, so if if you have probabilistic and you Um, so uh, there are two sort of positive answers. Uh, it uh, decays polynomially in N, uh, and that's certainly uh, that's the case if you use a nested schedule. And it decays exponentially in N if you use sort of that serial uh, schedule that I uh, showed in the previous uh, slide. So both are are right. <clears throat> 
Okay, so now what we want to do is to consider what do we do if we have a network rather than a linear repeater chain? Okay, suppose we have a, a network that consists of, of switches and let's say channels connecting the various switches. And let's say we know what the link bell pair generation rates are between two nodes. And um, uh, yeah, Bob uh, mentioned, I asked for the maximum, and in that case, you're right. Uh, polynomial is the best that you can do. And let's assume we know what the success swap probabilities are. Uh, and there it's QI for node I. And we pick two switches as end nodes. And what they want to do is to generate entanglement at the highest rate possible, generate bell pairs at the highest rate possible between them. Okay, there's only one user pair here. And here we're going to assume that time is slotted. Uh, each slot is divided into two phases. Um, uh, the first phase uh, generate entanglement, the second swap entanglement. And the performance metric is the entanglement distribution rate between S and T. And you can think of it that if we look at the number of bell pairs that we generate in T slots, and we divide by T and we just take the limit as T goes to infinity, that's what the, the distribution rate is. And the idea is that we're going to take the quantum network and the swap protocol, and we're going to use map it into a new graph, a new kind of graph, where we're going to have the nodes I'm going to refer to as E nodes for entanglement nodes, and they're going to represent qubit pairs. And then we're going to have uh, entanglement flows or E flows, which is are going to represent rates of entanglement exchanged uh, among E nodes. And this is going to be determined by the structure of the graph and the particular swap schedule that we're uh, uh, using. So just to give a concrete example, suppose that we have I and J and they're connected to each other through K and the entanglement rate for each of the links is lambda. And when link entanglements are generated at K, uh, we do swaps, they're probabilistic. And what they do is they generate the end-to-end -end entanglement between I and J. We're going to represent it by the following graph where we take, uh, we have an E node that represents uh, this pair of nodes, I and K. Uh, EKJ represents the pair KJ. Uh, we have one representing a uh, pair IJ. And what we have is that there's a rate uh, emanating from each of these uh, at which we generate entanglement, let's say, between I and J. <clears throat> okay. And this F is going to sort of denote what that rate is. And, and so looking at this uh, sequential schedule that I showed you earlier, we can represent it by the following uh, E graph. Um, we're going to take a, a E node between zero and one. And that's uh, corresponding to generating link level entanglement here uh, between one and two. And what they do is they feed into uh, entanglement or bell pair between zero and two, and they do it with rate lambda. Okay. Then the E node zero two coupled with one course, uh, con conforming to two, three maps into a, an E node uh, for the pair zero, three, 
And this is the rate at which uh, the entanglement is generated. And then likewise, we have uh, an E node for the pair 0, 4, and it's fed into by the E node for the pair 0, 3 and the pair 3, 4. Oops, let me go back. Oh, sorry, I made a mistake. Uh, Apologies, I uh, <clears throat> pushed the wrong button. Uh, okay, so this can be posed as an optimization problem. I'm, uh, I'm showing it in sort of bloody detail, but the only thing I want to point out is uh, the unknown variables are these flows between E nodes, Fs, and sort of the fraction of the flows that can be used, which are used. And all I want to point out is that the problem that we have here is linear in those quantities. And with that in mind, let me just sort of indicate what the different pieces are. We're given a, a network with a sort of known entang link entanglement rates, known swap probabilities, and the uh, what we're trying to do is to maximize the entanglement uh, rate uh, between source and the sync nodes. We have these variables that have to do with the E flows. And we have really just two kinds of constraints. We have conservation of E flows. Uh, or, and then we have some constraints on each of the E flow quantities. And as I said, really the most important thing about it is it, it maps into a very simple, a straightforward linear programming problem. And so the complexity for this is uh, polynomial in the size of the network, okay? And once you solve this linear programming problem, you can actually sort of pull out what the swap schedule has to be for each of the, the nodes. And so here's an example of optimal solution. This is, again, going back to our homogeneous repeater chain, uh, where we looked at this sort of nested schedule. And if we take an E node and E flow representation, it, it looks like this. Now, these essentially correspond to the different uh, uh, link pairs, and then uh, going down the hierarchy is corresponding to uh, the flows between 0 and 2, 2 and 4, and then finally at the end, 0 and 4. And if we sort of... Uh, look at the kind of performance that you would get. And this is just for a homogeneous repeater chain. Uh, I'm varying the number of repeaters. Uh, I'm keeping the total distance fixed. And so when I, as I increase the number of repeaters, I'm decreasing the distance between repeaters. And the request rate, the entanglement rate, is uh, given by this uh, exponentially decaying uh, function. And what we see is if the success probability for swaps is really high, then uh, there's very little dependence on the number of repeaters that you have. But as the success probability decreases, then you would like to uh, suffer fewer and fewer swaps. And so then you would uh, 
uh, choose a, a design where you would have few repeaters uh, that sort of are spread apart. So the challenge is uh, this work was done for the case of a single user pair. And for this to be really useful in a quantum network, it, it really has to be tailored to multiple user pairs and need to be able to handle noise. And uh, it assumed infinite memory. Uh, and so there's a need uh, to, to deal with that. And just to comment that that many routing path selection flow optimization uh, problems in quantum networks and classical networks map to sort of linear programming formulations, uh, possibly with some integer constraints. Linear, uh, so the question is, is linear programming the same as integer programming? And the answer is no. Linear programming has been shown to, to be uh, uh, possible, done possibly in polynomial time, whereas integer programming in general is not. Uh, many problems are, are sort of convert to integer linear programming formulations. And those, it, it depends on the structure of the problem, whether it's going to be NP complete or not. Um, just uh, uh, take a very, let's take a five minute break and, and I'll go back to answer a question that was asked about one of the graphs and then I'll turn it over to Mateos. Uh, so let me, Okay, so the, the question was, uh, why do you get this dip? Okay, so at the far left, the request rate is very small compared to the bell pair creation rate. And so what happens is that a, re a, a request comes in and it almost always finds a, a fresh bell pair. Uh, and so it can be teleported. As the request rate gets larger and larger, it turns out that the bell pairs uh, become less and less fresh, that they're starting to be used. And so when a new request comes in, the, the youngest bell pair it finds is, is not as young as it was when, when uh, the request rate was low. And so that happens until you sort of get to a dip here. If you come to the opposite side, the same thing is true here. Uh, a request qubits for teleportation are being generated very fast and uh, compared to bell pairs. And so when a bell pair is generated, there's always a young, a, a very fresh qubit to teleport. And so uh, it can do it, but as bell pairs get generated faster and faster, then the qubits to be teleported that they find uh, become less and less fresh. And, and that's why you get this dip. It's not quite symmetric because in one case, it's a single qubit. In the other case, it's a bell pair, which is two qubits. Um, so I hope that uh, answered. Uh, I'm going to stop sharing and pass it over to Mateos now, who's going to go on to the last topic. Thank you, Don. Uh, can you hear me well? Yes. Okay. Uh, let me share my screen. Uh, do you see my screen? Not yet. It says it started screen sharing. Oh. So double click to enter. Oh, let me see. 
Uh, so let me come here. Okay. Now. How about now? No, right? We see your screen. Okay. Oh. All right, let me do this. Uh... Now you can see. No. Okay. Black screen. Okay, let, let's try this then. Uh, let me share. Okay, now I can see. The, you can see my the slides, right? Yes. Okay. All right. So let's start with the final part of our short course. Uh, the topic that I'm going to talk about today is uh, a particular topic in network management called tomography. And to give you a brief outline of this final module of our presentation, I'm going to cover some overview, give you some, a brief overview on what network management is and what is tomography for networks. Uh, and then we're going to cover some uh, approaches to perform classical network tomography. Then we'll move to talk about methods to do quantum network tomography. We'll define what the problem is. Uh, and then progress through the description of algorithms to perform state distribution so that you can solve a tomography in quantum networks. And finally, you're going to apply this algorithm, the algorithms we described here to characterize star networks. Okay, so network management is a field that uh, uh, is essentially referring to some techniques to perform uh, a collection of data for network components. And the idea is to provide data to, to inform decision making by network managers. For instance, you can think of a, a, a management system to detect a faulty hardware and software, and also systems that could be used to determine the traffic patterns uh, for users of a network. And network tomography is a, essentially a subfield of a network management that has a goal to infer the behavior of uh, uh, network nodes or, or, or network components, uh, internal network components uh, from external nodes, which we see here in this figure as uh, orange computers. In practice, network tomography refers to the estimation of error parameters for internal components uh, 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 through end-to-end -end measurements. And the, the, the holy grail of network tomography is to come up with methods that provide identifiability. This means that given a set of observations for end-to-end -end measurements, we can compute a, a possible, a single estimate for the parameters that we're interested in estimating. And why would you want to do this in an end-to-end -end fashion? Well, performing end-to-end -end tomography would uh, 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 make that the, there's no need for the network to participate. The only thing that you need is uh, for end nodes to be able to communicate with each other. And essentially the measurement probes will just be regular packets, uh, uh, which is a functionality that is provided by the network. There's no administrative, uh, administrative access needed. Uh, uh, so the, the, the end nodes do not need to uh, be able to access uh, uh, directly the hardware that is uh, 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 essentially uh, uh, the network hardware infrastructure. Uh, you could use this sort of end-to-end -end estimation uh, to uh, perform a, uh, inference across multiple domains in the, in the internet uh, where you do not need some, somehow a cooperation uh, uh, of the domains you want to estimate. Uh, and this would allow the, the, the uh, other domains to monitor the service level agreements that Dan mentioned uh, uh, briefly when he talked about uh, a network of networks. Uh, and finally, it's interesting to perform end-to-end -end estimation because this gives the end nodes the ability to perform uh, 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 reconfigurable applications. For instance, uh, you could have video or audio uh, streaming services and change their, the, the, the rates of 
transmission for this particular uh, uh, streaming services based on how the your estimates for the internal parts of the network uh, are actually uh, working. Okay, so let me run a simple poll question to see if this was clear. Uh, why is end-to-end uh, -end estimation interesting? Okay. Let me look at the chat. Are you having trouble with my connection? Okay. Uh, so I can end the poll and share the results. Okay, yeah, so actually the, the correct answer is all of the above uh, as we directly uh, uh, discuss each one of these uh, options as why is it interesting. Okay, now let me stop sharing. Uh, cool, let's go back to the presentation. Uh, and the answer is, yeah, indeed, all of the above. All right, so before we talk about some of the main uh, uh, methods to do tomography in classical networks, we need some definitions. The first is about link level metrics, which is essentially what we are trying to estimate in this case. So imagine that I have a link uh, between these two users, A and B, and whenever A transmits a packet, uh, imagine that a delay is introduced in, trans in the transmission process, right? So it's not instantaneous. There's no sort of instantaneous transmission between A and B. And one example of a link level metric is a delay of the link. We also have uh, the, the, the loss rate for packets or the bit flip rate. Uh, we also need to talk about unicast communication, which is essentially a one-to-one -one sort of communication. So for instance, imagine that A wants to communicate uh, uh, to B and C. Uh, through the, in this very simple network, they're interconnected by the switch. And if A wants to send a message to B, you will send a message first to the switch, then it will then forward that message to B. And then if A wants to do the same thing for C, it will send a, a message to S, then it will then forward that message to C. And note here that if A wants to send the exact same message for B and C, it has to send the same message twice to the switch. Another way that we can do communications in classical networks is uh, through multicast, which is essentially a, a one-to-many sort of uh, communication scheme. In this case, let's imagine that A wants to send the same message to B and C. And what the network does is that it provides a tree for this communication to happen. And in this tree, the packets will only be duplicated as necessary. So in this case, A wants to send the same message again to B and C. You will send that message to S. And then the intermediate node at will duplicate that message into two packets and send one packet to B and one packet to C. And one interesting thing here is that, as I said before, this is literally defined over a tree where the unicast communication is defined over paths of the network. And finally, when we talk about uh, uh, estimation and, and an end-to-end -end idea, what we truly mean is that A, B, and C will gather some data from their estimation procedure, and then they will transmit that data to a particular uh, a fusion center in the network that will aggregate all the results and solve some problem or trying to come up with an, uh, an estimate for the metrics of uh, uh, interest in this case, the, the, for instance, the link level metrics we're interested in. And here, as is depicted here, uh, it's not necessary that this data fusion uh, 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 center is part of the communication. So with this, we can introduce a round trip unicast tomography. Uh, let's assume that we have, again, a, three, a four node star network, such as this one, and that we are referring to the, for the round trips of communication in the links with R sub J's here. So R sub zero is a round trip that it takes to send a package from A and the inter intermediate node and back. And in the, if we add an assumption that the links are symmetric, we will see that we can actually compute the delay introduced by the links uh, throughout communication. We'll also uh, uh, gonna assume that the link metrics we're interested in, in this case, the round trip uh, 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 time is additive. So if we compute the round trip time from A to B, 
we're going to assume that it is the sum of the round trip time from A to the intermediate node with the time from the intermediate node to B. So how do we perform tomography in this case? Well, we're going to send a packet from A to B uh, 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 and back. Uh, and this would allow us to measure directly the round trip time between A and B, which is again, the sum of the round trip times of these two links. We are gonna repeat this process for between A and C, which is gonna give us another measurement. And finally, repeat the process to B and C. And what we have here is something called a routing matrix that uh, uh, on the right hand side, and in fact, this is a simple uh, system of linear equations where we can measure the left-hand side directly and that we want to compute the value for the variables on the right-hand side. And in this particular case, it turns to be the case that this uh, matrix in the vertical, we have a linear independence between these equations and the system is identifiable, which means that by measuring the left hand side, we can come up with a single vector that explains the parameters we are trying to estimate. This is also true for general trees. You can try to use this idea of round trip unicast to uh, uh, solve the tomography problem for general trees. And uh, it's very interesting that we can even use this method to try to infer uh, link delays in general graphs as well. And the key idea here again is that we somewhat performing a measurement over cycles of the network because we are considering the round trip time. The bottom line is that we have a similar approach for losses. Uh, again, we are able to compute the round trip time uh, uh, and some one-way metrics for a subset of links. In that case, when we assume that the links are symmetric, the round trip time gives a direct estimator for the delays. And that even in the general networks, uh, if we are not able to essentially estimate possible values for all the links, we may, be, we may come up with approximations uh, uh, for the values of other links by, let's say, choosing delays to minimize the minimum squared error or to maximize entropy. Okay, so now let's, let me run another uh, poll here. Uh, yeah, you see in the screen. Oops. Okay. There we go. And it's, a, a, it's about unicast tomography. And it's a, the question is, what is a sufficient condition for link identifiability through unicast tomography? So I guess I, but, but put, I put the wrong ready. question. Yes, I, I, I put the wrong question. But the, the right answer is still there. Uh, Matthias, while you're waiting yeah. for that, there was a question that was asked that I inadvertently uh, uh, said I would answer live having to do with decoherence time. And uh -huh. decoherence time is, I understand, it's really the time it takes for fidelity to drop to either the minus one. Uh, that's how it's defined. That's how T2 is defined. Yeah. Okay. So you you saw uh, you all saw a different question in the in the in the slide and in the the poll box, but it actually had the correct answer. So uh, a sufficient condition for identifiability in unicast tomography is the invertibility of the routing matrix. If your routing matrix in, is invertible, you are able to identify the parameters of interest for each one of the links. You're gonna see this multicast question again in a bit. But let me uh, stop sharing for now and come back to the slides. Okay, so how to perform multicast? Uh, so how to perform network tomography with multicast? Uh, again, multicast probes uh, are transmitted through a multicast tree. And in this tree, the copies, uh, the packets are going to be copied only when needed. So in this case, for instance, if the source communicates to the receivers, it will send one package to the switch. The switch will then copy the packet and then send one version, one part of the co one copy to the receiver on the left, one another copy to the receiver on the right. And the key thing is that because there is a common link shared 
between industry, the receivers will observe a correlated performance. And the idea of multicast tomography is exactly to exploit this correlation to be able to estimate link parameters such as loss rates and delays. So let's uh, uh, take an example on loss rates. Let's imagine that for each one of these links, the alpha parameters are representing the chance of losing a packet upon transmission. And let's imagine that the source sends a packet to both of the receivers. If the receivers, if both receivers get that packet, it means that there, there had a successful transmission in all of the links. Now, if the receiver on the left does not receive a packet, but the receiver on the right does receive a packet, then we know for sure that an error occurred on the link connecting the switch to the left receiver. This is also true in the case where the receiver on the right does not receive a packet, but the receiver on the left, on the, on the left does receive a packet. And the idea is by counting the fractions of times that these receiver of these events where both received or one only one of the receivers received a packet, we know we, we can come up with estimates for the loss in, in, in the links. And even though we're not going to take a, a, a deep look at what the estimations estimators actually look like, the bottom line is that this binary tree is identifiable through this multicast process. And the key uh, idea exploited is the correlation uh, uh, that comes out of this common link in the multicast tree. And ideally, this provides you a different network utilization than unicast, again, because uh, uh, imagine that to perform this in unicast, you'd have to send two probes through this link uh, to get uh, 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 one estimate uh, uh, of a measurement on both uh, left and right receivers. While in a multicast, you only send a packet, one a single packet through this link. Okay, so now let me run the poll question again. Now, I'm, I lost my mouse. Okay, there we go. Relaunch poll. All right. And so now this is the poll for the multicast, and uh, the what you're seeing in uh, in the Zoom box is the same as where you're seeing the slide. Okay, let me give it. Ten more seconds. Okay. And so the result is that metric correlation in common links in the Mutek S3 is a key principle exploited here to uh, 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 obtain identifiability for that uh, uh, in multicast tomography. All right, so let's now talk about quantum network tomography. Well, before we had a classical network formed by classical components, and we had some methods for tomography in, in the classical network. And what we wanna do is to change these methods to perform tomography on a quantum network that is formed, that can be formed by for, let's say uh, even satellites, uh, some ground stations, they can be connected through fiber. You can have uh, uh, free space links and where the end nodes are essentially quantum processors rather than classical uh, processors. And the motivation for this is essentially that quantum network, uh, quantum hardware is extremely inhomogeneous. We have a, a variety of different physical platforms uh, of different fibers that you can use. Uh, the links for the satellite links, uh, the the free space links, differ drastically from the the ground uh, uh, from from fibers, uh, and it, it would be interesting to be able to characterize what's happening in different parts of this network uh, uh, through the end nodes. You also have, as I said, hybrid communication media because you can send photons through fiber or through free space, and this would bring the uh, 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 the idea of network management to the context of quantum networks, enabling the identification of faulty network hardware, uh, providing again information uh, uh, for decision making and enabling uh, applications like noise informed quantum error correction, where you could uh, 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 essentially uh, modify your uh, decoders uh, based on the 
the descriptions for the errors in the network. Another interesting uh, thing that this brings uh, to the table is that uh, the end nodes could perform quality assurance. So imagine that you have you pay for a quantum metric service and you'd like to verify if the service that you're paying for is actually the service being provided to you. And one way to do that would be to perform quantum metric tomography. Uh, uh, and there, it's interesting in this way because you remove the, the, the need to trust on the, your network provider uh, to tell you how good their service is. It would also allow reconfigurable applications such as for instance, distributed quantum computing where we can imagine that the and nodes could decide to do or not to perform an audit computation distributedly based on the state of the network, the state that are inferring uh, from these measurements. Okay, so how do we uh, migrate from classical to quantum? Well, in classical, we had link level metrics, and this concept would be transformed to quantum channel parameters in the quantum world. We had probes, packet probes in the classical domain, where in the quantum, we have state distribution processes. Unicast becomes bipartite state distribution, which Don talked to you about when you're trying to distribute an, uh, a bell state between uh, two end nodes. Multicast becomes multipartite state distribution. And finally, end-to-end -end measurements become measure quantum measurements performed in the end nodes. And let's cover some background so that we can talk about quantum metric tomography uh, 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 properly. So let's talk about mixed states. We know that pure states describe closed quantum systems and that they are efficiently represented by unit norm, uh, uh, by unit norm vectors in a complex space that, uh, that we call a Hubert space. And what mixed states are, they are actually a statistical ensemble of quantum states. For instance, imagine that I have a qubit preparation device that whenever you press a button, the device provides you with one qubit. And imagine that if you take enough samples, you will see that 60% of these samples are in state zero and 40% are in state plus. The way we represent this sort of process is through mixed states and density matrices. And of course here, this is just a, a, an image to give you a, a flavor of the concept, but uh, it really doesn't matter uh, on the order. It's just it, if you take uh, an, a large enough number of samples, you see 60% of them to be zero and 40% uh, of them to be a plus state. And so what are density matrix? Well, to talk about them, let's imagine that we have a single qubit. If it is a pure state, we describe the state of that qubit with a unit vector in a Hubert space that has dimension two. And we know that if we take the outer product of that vector with itself, we have a matrix that is a projector. And a mixed state is nothing more than a combination of projectors for pure states with uh, uh, coefficients that determine a probability for you to see that state in your ensemble. Density matrices are Hermitian, positive, sem positive semi-definite, and they have unit trace. Again, if you have that example that I, uh, uh, I showed you before, where we have a qubit preparation device that 60% uh, of the time spits out a zero, 40% a plus state, uh, we can take the projector for the zero state, the projector for the plus state, which is shown here, and compute rho, the density matrix, uh, uh, by simply summing each one of these matrices, each multiplied by the corresponding probability. And this would be uh, your final, uh, uh, an example for a density matrix. What we also need to understand is how qubits will change when we send them through the network. And for the purpose of this talk, we're going to assume that the links of our network are actually single qubit polychannels. So mathematically, you represent uh, uh, such polychannels with uh, a summation of this form here, okay, which has the density matrix here, sandwiched by poly operators, sigma case here, and with a coefficient in front that are actually representing probabilities again. So as I, I said before, the sigma case are just the poly operators. You can imagine that sigma zero is I, sigma one is X, sigma two is Y, and sigma three is Z. And that these thetas here are just probability values. And whenever we sum this for all K, what do we get back is one. And to give you some examples, 
of single qubit polychannels. The bit flip channel is a single qubit polychannel that maps state zero to state one, state one to state zero, and that is represented by this particular equation here, this operator summary presentation, where uh, we have rho with probability uh, theta sub e and x rho x with probability one minus theta sub e. A phase flip is similar, but it's a channel that maps a state plus to state minus, state minus to state plus, and it has the same form of the bit flip channel, where the only difference is that instead of using the x poly operator, we use z here. And another example is if you merge these two things together, you would have a bit and phase flip channel that would re be represented by this particular transformation here. And where we note that the sum for this probability theta sub e is here, theta sub e zero plus theta sub e one plus theta sub e two would be equal to one. We also need some operational assumptions. Uh, we're going to assume that the end nodes of our network perform quantum circuits. They are able to perform any quantum circuits you'd like. They can request a network to provide ne to, to perform network state distribution, and they can specify quantum circuits to be ran by intermediate nodes in the network. For the, in the intermediate node side, uh, we're going to assume that the intermediate nodes can receive requests for circuits and for state distribution, that they have access to some ancilla qubits, but they are not allowed to perform measurements for estimation. And that's how we're going to get the end-to-end -end flavor uh, uh, here in the, in the quantum network tomography setting. So when you put all of this together, our quantum network model looks like this. Our network is a graph, okay, where the nodes represent quantum processors and the links are representing quantum channels interconnecting these processors. They can either be fiber optics or free space channels. Uh, we're going to have N nodes, which in this are here depicted by nodes A, B, C, D, and E. And we're going to have intermediate nodes here shown as F, J, K, and L. And that each link in this network is actually a single qubit poly channel that has a particular uh, 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 representation like the one shown here in this equation. Also, uh, I'm going to describe the tomography methods here uh, in the setting of one-way quantum transmission, uh, but it's, uh, it's analogous to two-way. And in fact, you can translate all of the methods that I'm described here, I'm going to describe here to the two-way setting with some uh, small modifications. But for the purpose of exposition, it's easier to talk about one way, uh, 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 to, to talk about the methods of, for quantum network tomography in the one-way setting. Okay, so let's define the problem of quantum network tomography. Our input is a network with a bipartition, uh, a partition uh, uh, of the nodes into N nodes and intermediate nodes. The output is an estimator for all the probabilities characterizing the poly channels in our network. And the constraint is that we can only perform quantum measurements for estimation in the end nodes. And how do we solve this problem? Uh, how do we map the quantum network tomography problem into a problem of uh, uh, quantum estimation? Well, let's imagine that we have this four node star network here. And the first thing we need to do is to perform parametrization. So we need to use the network, in this case, the intermediate node V, to distribute a quantum state among the end nodes. And this state, it's a mixed state that should depend on the probabilities uh, that are characterizing the poly channels. We also need measurements in the end nodes. So here, imagine that we created this uh, uh, a particular quantum state in the registers located in the end nodes. And once we measure those these states, the outcomes, what we see out of these measurements will actually depend on the parameters that you want to estimate. And finally, we need to send all the classical data that comes out of this uh, quantum measurements to a data fusion center uh, 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 in the network that will 
pick the aggregate result and come up with an estimator for the probabilities that we're trying to estimate. Okay, uh, so let's zoom in into the process of uh, uh, parameterization. Let's imagine that we have this generic uh, network here, which is not a tree. And we're going to take an approach that is very similar to the multicast approach I talked to you about in the, in the classical context. So we're going to perform state preparation in a rooted tree of G. In this case, let's suppose this particular tree here uh, uh, shown by this uh, red arrows. The state will start in the root, which is in this case the node U, and uh, uh, it will be distributed to leaves W0 and W2. There is a W1 missing here. There are two W3s here, but uh, uh, I'm going to fix this later. So you know, the idea is that by performing this uh, uh, distribution, the state, of course, will depend on the probabilities uh, uh, that we want to estimate or the theta values for each one of the links in this tree. And we can actually characterize all links by repeating this process for different trees. So here, what I'm showing you is a covering of this graph with two trees, the red one and the blue one. And if we can characterize the red and the blue, we can essentially characterize all the links. As remarks, remember that tree generalizes paths. So you can still take some of this to come up with a, a method to perform tomography a, uh, in a unicast or, or in a bipartite state generation uh, a distribution uh, uh, context. Uh, and it's also remember that even though we're going to talk about things in a one way setting, it's everything you're discussing here is compatible with the two way architecture. All right. So, what happens when we send a qubit through the link? So, essentially, state distribution is the preparation of quantum states in end nodes using network, the network. And suppose in this case that we have this very simple three node network uh, and R prepares where each one of the links is a bit flip uh, representing a bit flip channel with probability theta E, we get the state with ascent through the link with probability one minus theta E, we get a flipped version of the qubit we sent. Let's imagine that R prepares a qubit in state zero. It sends the qubit through the node in the middle. The, Q, the, the density matrix described in the state will be uh, this particular density matrix here, row one, where we have zero with probability theta naught, uh, 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 one with probability one minus theta naught. And once the switch sends that qubit to the end node, to the other end node, our final density matrix looks like this. And even though this is a big expression, it's a very simple expression. The only thing that's telling us is that we see zero with probability theta zero times theta one plus one minus theta zero, one minus theta one. And we see one with probability one minus this initial probability here. So note that the final density matrix does depend on both parameters on theta zero and theta one. And we're going to perform measurements on density matrix like this to estimate theta zero, uh, uh, theta, uh, the thetas that we are interested in. All right, so what will intermediate nodes do in the distribution? We allow them to perform quantum circuits, but they are not allowed to perform quantum measurements. So imagine that V receives a qubit from a node U. V will apply a circuit C sub V that it was defined by the end nodes on the qubit that it received with an ancilla qubit or, or a, a set of ancillas. And this qubit is CV. And then it will, after it performs this circuit, V will simply send one qubit to a, a, a node W0 and one qubit to node W1. And note that this, uh, 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 I, I talk through this process as if we only had two N, uh, uh, N nodes here, but it's actually a generic in the sense that we could think of N N nodes by simply tweaking the size of this circuit C sub T here. And the remarks is that this is a very generic procedure, again, because we allow the end nodes to stipulate what are the circuits to be 
uh, uh, executed by the intermediate nodes. Uh, we are restricting ourselves to the case where we only use a single qubit. Uh, we only transmit a single qubit in a link. And we're also going to consider that no matter what we do in our intermediate node, there are no remaining qubits after distribution is done. So if we take that sort of uh, node operation as an atomic operation, we can come up with a distribution process that will work for any sorts of trees that we can think of. And the procedure is going to be something like this. So the root will prepare qubits. It will send one of these qubits to a downstream neighbor, which in this case is V0. V0 will apply a node operation that it was specified by the end nodes and send the re outputs of this uh, operation to nodes that are, again, down, uh, 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 down in, the, in the tree. And the, this process will be repeated until all leaves receive one qubit. And if we do so, what we had at the end of the day is a, a mixed state that depends on the parameters for each one of the channels. We can take this particular uh, a tree distribution algorithm to perform tomography on a quantum switch directly because uh, we can imagine that a switch it's, uh, 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 generates a network that has a star topology, which is a particular type of a tree. And so to give you some definitions, uh, stars are just trees with maximum hop distance to be two. So the distance between all n nodes here is two. Uh, we're going to assume that we have uh, channels described by a single poly operator. So we, we need to estimate one parameter for each one of the channels. And let's assume for exposition that it has bit flips. And also that we are restricted, uh, restricting ourselves to a star with four nodes because the estimators we're going to derive are uh, easily extendable to the case of n nodes. All right, recall that uh, qubits live in a Hilbert space with two dimensions and that the representation for a bit flip channel, which is the channel we're assuming here, uh, uh, is something like this. Let me also define a notation to talk about uh, states in the GHC basis and Bell states. Uh, cat phi sub SB will be a state like this. You have 0s plus minus 1 to the b, 1 s bar over root 2, where s is an n minus 1 bit string, and b is a single bit. And you can essentially uh, talk about any particular uh, uh, state in a JT basis using an equation like this. To give you an example, if you think about a two qubit uh, 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 a state in a uh, two qubit GT basis, this, uh, those are the Bell states or the uh, EPR pairs. And uh, we can use this notation to, for instance, write down the state 0, 1 minus 1, 0 over root 2, which is simply phi of 1, 1. And as a shorthand, whenever uh, uh, we write phi sub s b without being inside a cat or a bra, what we have is a projector for that state. And the protocol that we're going to uh, see here for tomography is a protocol that uses GT state distribution to estimate uh, the link parameters. OK, so let's talk about uh, state distribution and measurements. The procedure is very simple. The root will prepare the state phi 0, 0, which you can all see here in this equation, in the root here is v0. It will send one qubit to the center node, v3. The center node will apply this circuit here. A is the qubit that it received, and this qubit here is an ancilla qubit that initialized in state zero. And it will uh, perform an x operator followed by two Hadamards, followed by an x, and then a c naught. And it will then send one qubit of this uh, uh, output to v1, the other qubit to v2. And the end nodes, or the leaves here, will try to measure the state, will perform a measurement of the, the distributed state in the GAT basis. 
So this is the, essentially the protocol we are looking at. And how does the state evolve as we perform distribution? Well, we started with a state phi zero zero. We sent one qubit to V3. Then the state in V3 becomes theta naught phi zero zero plus one minus theta naught phi one zero. We perform the circuit specified before. And the output for the circuit is in fact a three qubit mixed state that has this form. So it's the state phi zero zero with zero with probability theta zero and the state phi zero zero one here with probability one minus theta zero. And then when the switch sends these two qubits to the end nodes, what we have is a mixed state that is diagonal on the GHC basis and where these uh, uh, P sub E's here, B of B, F1, S2, are actually referring to the probabilities of measuring a particular state in the GHC basis given that you have this density matrix, this, this mixed state row three here. All right, so again, we call that tomography circuit we applied is something like this. Okay, so uh, how do you transform this density matrix into estimators? Again, recall that we had a, a density matrix that was diagonal on the GT basis having this form. And we can actually write down a table to map all the probability, the probabilities of seeing each one of the states in the GT basis. So the probability to see state 0, 0, 0 plus 1, 1, 1 is a probability of measuring the bit B as 0 and this, the bits S1 and S2 as 0, 0. And there's nothing more than theta 0 times theta 1 times theta 2. Now the probability to measure state 0, 0, 1 plus 1, 1, 0 is probably of measuring the bit B as 0 and the bit S1 as 0 the bit S2 as one, and is theta zero times theta one times one minus theta two. And if you look at this table closely enough, you will notice that this distribution here is actually a joint distribution of independent Boolean random variables. They're representing this bit right here. So the probability to see bit B as a zero is theta zero, while the probability of seeing bit B equals one is one minus theta zero. The probability of seeing bit S1 as zero is theta one, of seeing bit S1 as one is one minus theta one. And it's, that's the same for bit S2 and theta two. And so we had this particular network with uh, uh, channels E0, E1, and E2. And it turns out that the estimators for the parameters you want to estimate are simply the fractions that we count uh, bit B as zero in our JT measurements, the fraction of times that we take uh, uh, that we, we see bit S1 as zero and bit S2 as zero. So the bottom line is that the bit flip star is identifiable, and we do so by simply measuring the states that are distributed in the GHC basis. Uh, the bits B and S of J's will give direct estimators for the parameters uh, 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 theta for each one of the links. We can generalize this idea to other po uh, 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 poly channels, where instead of ha having bit flips, you might have a channel that performs a phase flip or applies a Y operator with a given fraction of time. It's also very important to notice that entanglement is not required for identifiability. It actually just helps to uh, 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 estimate the parameters in the sense that it reduces by half the number of samples needed when the end nodes cannot perform global measurements. So uh, this idea of measuring the GAT basis require the end nodes to have pre-shared entanglement, but they can measure in different basis and still be able to identify the parameters with the cost of uh, 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 needing to, to use more samples. Okay, so uh, another uh, interesting thing here is that the tomography circuit we discussed actually encodes the parameter theta zero into the phase of the GT state, which is the bit B that we, uh, we were using. 
And if you want to see some numerical results, if you were to simulate the, the, the protocol that I showed you before uh, and plot the value for your estimator uh, with number of samples, you would see uh, something like this. Each one of these curves is telling you the, uh, your estimate for each uh, one of the parameters in the links. And uh, you, you get a glimpse of what the convergence rate looks like by comparing these, by looking at how these two curves approach the correct value, which is represented by dashed lines. Okay, so let me run a simple uh, poll question. Uh, I lost, okay. All right. Uh, which would be this. Let me just make sure I have the correct one. Okay. All right. Let me end the poll and share the results. And the answer is actually only one solution because it's actually, we're actually estimating the parameter vector uh, 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 directly and not each one of the uh, individual values. So in fact, it would be three solutions if, you, if, if I was asking how many parameters there are. But since we're talking about the parameter vector, it's only one solution. And let me sh run another poll question here. Stop sharing this one. Okay. Those are the results for our uh, other question. And now let's move to the final question. This one. That is, what are the consequences for uh, uh, estimation when we cannot perform global measurements in the nodes? Okay. All right. Okay, so the actual answer is that the sample complexity is still the same, but actually it requires, uh, it doubles the, the number of samples required to obtain the same efficiency. Uh, note that the parameters are still identifiable uh, and there's no change in the, the asymptotic uh, analysis uh, on the number of samples required. You still have a linear, uh, a number of samples required, but it, you just need twice as many as you had when you could perform global measurements. Okay, so now let me stop sharing this uh, all here and get back to the slides. Okay, so just to conclude, uh, quantum metric tomography is essentially a channel parameter estimation in a quantum network that captures the characterization of links from an end-to-end -end perspective. And uh, there is some notion here that the uh, estimators can indicate some uh, advantage if you have access to entanglement because you only need half as many samples to obtain the same uh, sort of uh, 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 efficiency in estimator, given that you have entanglement uh, uh, at your disposal. All right. And there are some open problems that I'm going to uh, uh, pass through very quickly. Uh, it's, it would be interesting to understand what is actually the optimal estimation strategy for the stars. It, it may be that just simply trying to do a, a distributed GHC state uh, among the end nodes is not the optimal uh, strategy that you can really do. Uh, there may be, uh, uh, it would be also very interesting to try to see how you can generalize these estimators for uh, uh, arbitrary trees. Uh, it would be nice uh, uh, to understand how, what is the, also the optimal way to partition the network in trees for, uh, so that it can uh, perform estimation and recover 
the uh, parameter values for all the links. It would be also very nice to try to investigate what is the difference between bipartite and multipartite uh, protocols for tomography in the, in the quantum setting. Finally, I guess it would be wonderful to have to be able to describe under which conditions entanglement actually provides an advantage for the, pro uh, uh, for the purpose of estimation. And of course, do that in a fairly way. You need to come up with optimal estimation strategies where you can use entanglement, uh, use entanglement and cannot use entanglement and see how things would change. And again, uh, to describe conditions uh, where generic trees are identifiable. Here I have shown uh, that the, the binary tree with that particular uh, single poly uh, channel model is identifiable. Finally, even in the, the start case, it would be very nice to generalize these efficient estimators, efficient in the sense that they only require a polynomial amount of, uh, of samples to allow you to estimate uh, uh, channels uh, and uh, extend that to poly channels that are actually uh, uh, more complex uh, channels where you could have not only a single poly operator, but many of them. Okay. And uh, with that, I will, I guess we're a bit over time. Let me, uh, I, I'll skip some of the slides uh, and we can discuss a bit more uh, in the, uh, using through the Q&A func uh, functionality. And I, I'd like to finish the presentation. So thank you all for listening to Don and, and I. And uh, we have also a, an evaluation service uh, survey that you can access uh, once you close the Zoom section. Uh, Mateus, there's a question. Uh, could quantum network tomography be done using only classical input states? Yes, you could. OK, I, I guess I went to a, a, a weird slide here, but let me stop sharing. So the, the answer is yes, you could do quantum metric tomography using only classical states. You might only run into some trouble where you cannot, maybe you won't have identifiability, even for that particular uh, uh, binary uh, case that we were discussing. So it really depends. But uh, you can, you, the, the short answer is yes, you can, but it may be much more efficient to use uh, assume that it can use entanglement. Um, yeah, so thanks everybody for listening to us. We had hoped to be able to sort of like have some concluding uh, remarks uh, and looking at what we had, I think maybe the one thing uh, to say is, you know, this was not a comprehensive uh, coverage of quantum network principles. And uh, there were several topics that we didn't cover. Uh, one of them was, uh, well, we mostly focused on two-way architectures or architectures where you're generating and distributing entanglement. Uh, and there are a lot of interesting problems that come up with one-way architectures, primarily uh, having to do with designing efficient quantum error correction protocols. But I'm guessing that there's a short course on that uh, uh, later on. Something else that we also didn't talk about was uh, anything having to do with the control plane. Uh, I guess everything we did was really uh, looking at the data plane or using it for uh, tomography. And although I touched a little bit on, let's say, path selection in the context of the combined swap scheduling and flow optimization, uh, there's we didn't really go into it in, in great detail. Uh, I would say at this point, that's probably the area that has seen the largest number of papers uh, sort of emanating from the classical uh, networking community, but applied to quantum networks. And uh, 
one of the things we'll do is disseminate sort of like a, a bibliography that will have a pretty complete list of, of those papers for those of you who want to look into that more. Um, Okay, thank you all. <laughs>